George's beautiful Road Atlanta. Welcome to the 17th annual Petit Le Mans 10-hour endurance classic powered by Mazda. Final event of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship for 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Varsha with Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. Inspired by the renowned 24 Hours of Le Mans in France, the Petit Le Mans has always had close links to that French endurance classic, and so it's become a tradition to include the French national anthem with that of the USA in the pre-race ceremonies. Let's go trackside now to PA announcer Greg Kramer. And once again, please rise and remove your hats as we present an honor tradition for the Petit Le Mans powered by Mazda and Jeffrey Akana of the Capital City Opera Company to perform the French national anthem. Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour des gloires est arrivé. Contre nous de la tyrannie, les tendances sanglantes élevées, les tendances sanglantes élevées. Entendez-vous dans les campagnes, mugissent ces ferocieux soldats. Ils viennent jusqu'au dans vos bras, égorger vos fils, vos campagnes. Aux armes citoyens, dormez vos bataillons. Marchons, marchons, cassons un pied, abreuvez vos sillons, aux armes citoyens, formez vos bataillons, marchons, marchons, cassons un pied, abreuvez vos Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing as renowned vocalist Trina Vargas she comes all the way from New York City to perform our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Nobody does opening ceremonies like Road Atlanta at the Petit Le Mans. Those were the SOCOM parachute para commandos. There you see their landing area at the lower left corner of your screen. While we have a couple of minutes before that all important command, fellas, let's talk a little bit about what's at stake here today. We've got championships in all four classes on a difficult racetrack and a big, big field. You know, there's a certain percentage of these guys that are going for a championship. The rest of them are going for a win. That's really big. I mean, this is a really renowned racetrack and a, and a race that's really important. Petit Le Mans has become one of the best endurance events in the world. Come away from here with a win, that'd be great, Cal. 
It would, but this is a tough one, Dorsey. I mean, you've got to factor in as a massive field here this year, 50 plus cars. That means 150 drivers, Bob. I mean, most of these guys bring in a third driver to assist with the length of the race. There's a couple of two driver teams out there, but essentially there's three drivers rotating. They all have different techniques. You come across the car on one hour, the next hour is a different guy behind the wheel that's going to do something different. So you've got to manage that, make those correct decisions, and it's 10 hours in length. It's never ending. I think it was KK Rosberg when asked once why he didn't or why he waited so long before he eventually drove the 24 hours of Le Mans. He said, I had to convince myself that there were 180 other drivers in the world that I was comfortable going 200 miles an hour in the dark and the rain down the Molson straight with. That may be a little extreme, but you get the idea. We'll also be following the progress of this final round of the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup, honoring the most successful teams at the four longest races of the year. The Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona, the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, the Salen 6 Hours of Watkins Glen, which of course have all taken place to this point, and today the 10 Hours of the Petit Le Mans powered by Mazda. Now let's go back down to the PA announcer, Greg Kramer. And we are the home of all U.S. Special Operations, to include the U.S. Army Rangers, U.S. Army Green Berets, U.S. Navy SEALs, and the U.S. Air Force Pararescue. And today, I'm going to present the governor with a baton passed in free fall. Ladies and gentlemen, this baton was passed in free fall. Thank you very much. I am proud to accept it. Drivers, start your engines. All right, this exceptional field comes to life. And with that, the engines fire up. Six, eight, 10, 12 cylinders, turbocharged and normally aspirated. That's the essence of endurance sports car racing, mechanical diversity, as well as a tremendous and fulsome driver lineup. Nerves are jingling right, right yeah. now, oh, I mean, this is a pressure cooker right now. I mean, titles are on the line, and you can have a problem on this first lap. So you want the car to run strong. you also got to keep out of trouble. There's going to be guys going for the race win. They don't care about that championship. A lot of adrenaline right now. I mean, I tell you, you just tighten those belts down and mind your manners, boys. Well, you make a great point, Dorsey. In addition to the teams and drivers going for championships here today for themselves, for their manufacturers, there's also the prospect of winning one of the world's great endurance races. Engines are running. The field sets off. The green flag awaits. We'll be back with more of the 17th annual Petit Le Mans, powered by Mazda from Road Atlanta. Drivers, start your engines. That was moments ago as the Honorable Nathan Deal, governor of the great state of Georgia, ordered the drivers to fire up and head on track. Now here's a look at the Patron North American Endurance Cup. As I mentioned, the four longest races of the year, 52 total hours of racing, 10 coming today. Those are the leaders in their respective classes. What's at stake? Big dollars, $100,000 to the high point scoring prototype and GT Le Mans teams, $50,000 in the classes of Prototype Challenge and GT Daytona. We'll explain those classes as we go forward. If you're unfamiliar with the Tudor United Sports Car Championship, there's the number five from Action Express in the hands of our pole sitter, Joao Barbosa. They lead not only the Drivers Championship in the prototype class, but also the Series Championship and the Patron Cup. Yeah, it's been a brilliant season for this team. Really what I'd call Ganassi-esque, which has really been the most successful team in this series for a number of years. But they've run a really great year. They've got to sort of like close out here. But if they start the race, they'll clinch the team championship. 45 minutes each driver, Barbosa and Fittipaldi. That will give them the driver's title as well. And they'll be sharing with another all-star who comes to join them for the endurance races. Sebastian Bourdais, a four-time American IndyCar champion. Now let's go to the pit lane and meet the first of our pit reporters, Chris Neville. Well, Bob, and GTLM, the pole sitter, Nick Tandy grabbing it for Porsche, our 11th different pole sitter in GTLM this year. And Porsche started on the front row at the early season Enduros, the Rolex 24 and the 12 hours of Sebring, converting those starting spots into wins. But since then, Porsche hasn't seen a pole position and hasn't seen victory lane. In GTLM, the manufacturer battles so much focus on that, we've still got four main contenders there, BMW, Porsche, Dodge, and Chevrolet, with Porsche and Dodge tied for the overall lead. It's all gonna be decided in 10 hours. For more on GT Daytona, Matt Yoakum.
Chris, it's going to be an exciting and drama-filled day ahead in GT Daytona with a number of mixed agendas, championships on the radar for some, while others, like TRG, focus solely on a win. James Davison showed impressive speed in qualifying, putting the Aston Martin on pole for the fourth straight race, just edging out Patrick Dempsey's Porsche team. Although they've shown that impressive speed all year, they haven't been able to capitalize with a win. They couldn't pick a better race to break through the past five petites, three podiums, including a win. Andrew Marriott. In the PC class, the LMPC class, what a battle for the pole. Two Brits going for it. Jack Horsworth, the rising indie star, and Tom Kimbersmith. In the end, it was Horsworth who took it. And then, Gentilozzi's second entry, Bruno Junqueira, I suppose a fallen indie star in a way. He sneaked through to second. Timber Kiss, sorry, Tim. Kimber Smith is uh, third, so uh, it should be a really good battle between them, and I'll pop my teeth back on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. I know you're going to give us a unique perspective on this race. You'll also get one from a fleet of onboard cameras aboard the cars. Here's a look at six of them. Good looks at the drivers in the office, as it were. We'll have cameras in all of the classes of representative cars, including the championship contenders. Let's turn now to our Tudor Keys to Victory, Calvin. Well, a big one is traffic management, 50 plus cars. That's 20 cars per mile around this racetrack. You have to be careful. Consequences, a bump in hour two, you may survive, but maybe the car breaks in hour nine. Then cool at the finish. Ambient and track temperatures are supposed to plummet here this evening. You want to make the right choices with a car set up, and you certainly want your fastest bullet in that gun to try and finish this game out. Our Continental starting grid crosses the top of your screen. The different colored background of the driver's names indicate which class they are in. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. But right now it's time to go racing. Final round of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship for 2014. Under the bridge and down the hill they come through turn 12, Barbosa on the front row and he will lead the field across the start. Green flag waves, we're underway. Very controlled start, I like to see that. Everybody nice. You gotta be careful, but look at that. Oz Negri has made a big move from six on the grid. Looks like he's side by side and gets by. The Ganassi car heading up into turn three. Traffic jam up here, three gets tight. Then it's down through the sweeping S's. You build a lot of speed down here. Oh, 10 hour race, and as we say so often, you can't win the race at the first corner, but you could certainly lose it. Look at Negri, he is up to third. He's got ahead of the Visit Florida machine driven by Mike Rockenfeller, the German. Not one of the guys in it for the championship. He wants that win. Well, Ford want to win. Right yeah. now it's a Corvette 1-2, then the Ford powered car, followed by another GM machine. Well, guys, a lot of tiptoe in these first couple laps. Air temp only in the low 60s. I just checked track temp, that just in the high 60s. So talking with some of these drivers, they said it takes about four laps to get heat in the tires. I'm already seeing lockup down here in turn one on that first lap. Now yeah, that's going to be a crucial factor here today is managing those tires, particularly tonight as well when it cools down. You go out on cold tires, it's a condition you haven't seen here all week long in testing. Had a lot of rain the other day, too. Probably a pretty green racetrack, not a lot of rubber down. It poured here yesterday. Portuguese driver Joao Barbosa leads, heading into turn one as the American Ricky Taylor in the Konica Minolta machine in second, but Negri is putting the pressure on. About 145 miles an hour on the entry to turn one. Took the words right out of my mouth. It's really fast up It's quick. <laughs> and it's a blind corner. The driver can't see the entry to the corner till he's in it. Such a thrill to drive this racetrack. I mean, this is what drivers are about. Really high speed corners, but the consequences you pay if you get it wrong are very big. You see the different machinery there. Two classes of prototype, two classes of GT machines, which we'll explain a bit further. But right now, Taylor now finding his stride in that black car in second spot going to hound Barbosa here. He'll pick up a bit of a draft, Dorsey. That car in front will punch a hole in the air and allow that second car to go a little bit quicker than the straightaway. Definitely will. And it really comes into prominence here where you start going down this hill into the brake zone. You really get sucked up behind. Look at this. It will throw you forward in the seat belts. Oh, yeah. It is really tight here, really slow. Then back on the power hard without abusing those tires. You don't want to burn them off early in this stint. Saw the specs of the prototype category, the marquee class, if you will. 
setup is a real problem for these cars that rely so much on aerodynamic downforce to force the car onto the track and allow it to carry speed through the corner. Look at through the back. this part of the track, they want all the downforce they can get through the S's, switching back and forth. But when they get onto that long back stretch, they want to just pin their ears back, get all the drag and downforce off the car to reach terminal velocity. At the back of that is that Delta wing, fan favorite, if you will. It's running really good, Calvin. It was fastest this morning in warm up. Yeah, it's really, really quick. They've been strong here. This is their home. Oh, that was tight. Oh. Negri locks up in traffic. And through goes Rockenfeller and takes the third spot. That Ferrari had a problem in the warm-up. That 49 machine hit the wall down through the S's. I think they just got him back on track, and he's gradually getting up to speed. That was a big moment. We talked about traffic management as one of the two to keys to victory. You saw it right there. Ferrari had to have a lot of repair done to it in a very short period of time, so probably just feeling that one back out. It had suspension damage for sure. Looking at Rojas there in the white and blue Ganassi machine. Not the season they'd been hoping for in terms of the championship, but three wins coming off a huge win at Circuit of the Americas. They want more here today. Climbing that hill. It's down about 120 miles an hour at apex. And then into these S's, this ribbon of asphalt. You're going to wind up through the gears here, flat out in about 145 miles an hour as you hit the brakes there for turn five. See the crowds up against the fence. This has always been a popular race, but the crowd is bigger than I've ever seen it in 17 years of coming here to Road Atlanta. On board one of the GTLM or GT Le Mans class cars, basically a factory war, but there are a couple of privateer teams in the mix as well. Should be our pole sitter, Nick Tandy. Had a great lap in qualifying. Awesome. This guy is really, really quick. Has really been with Porsche for a number of years, but he has burst onto the scene here. Really, really impressive to lay that lap down yesterday. Certainly faster than his teammates, but quicker than the rest of the field as well. And this class, GTLM, GT Le Mans, is sensational with a manufacturer's support, spending multi-millions of dollars. Here's a look at one of those privateer teams, the Falcon Boys. They won here last year. That's what a right. shocker that was, and they'd love to do the same. They've been quick here. Brian Sellers qualified that car in the third spot. They do a lot of testing here at this racetrack. Brian literally lives just a couple of minutes down the road. He'd love to get another victory on home soil. Saw so Brian Sellers flashing the headlights. He's trying to tell the PC car in front of him that he thinks he's being held up by that prototype car, and he probably is. Four different classes running together. They have different performance factors. Down the straightaways, there's not that much bigger difference, but the downforce factor between a prototype and a GT car is huge through this twisty section of the racetrack. Road Atlanta really has a split personality. You need downforce, as you mentioned, Bob, through this section, but you want it trimmed out and you need the straightaway speed. Beautiful red Ferrari is an example of the GT Daytona class on board a prototype just behind the 62 of Alessandro Balzan. That's the brand new Ligier. With the Honda power plant, they've had engine trouble this weekend. I've had to do a couple bullet changes, actually. Young Brit Alex Brundle behind the wheel. He was going to be a factor for the pole position, but they blew another motor, as you mentioned, Dorsey. And he's just got to be careful in this first car. Had to start at the very back of this 50 car field and has just worked his way through. Now up to eighth in class, but the car has a lot of speed. He just needs patience right now to let the race come to him a little bit. On board the number 93 Dodge Viper SRT, Jonathan Barmarito. Started second, currently running fifth. A break coming up. We'll be back to talk about the prototype challenge and GT Daytona categories. Two of the four classes of car racing among the more than 50 total entries here at Petit Le Mans. Twenty fourteen marks a new era for sports car racing in North America with the debut of the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. The Tudor Championship brings together the best of two series that ran in parallel for more than a decade. The Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series and the American Le Mans Series presented by Tequila Patron are now one organization under IMSA sanction. 
This year's inaugural 13 race schedule includes internationally recognized events, such as the Rolex 24 at Daytona, the 12 hours of Sebring, the six hours of the Glen, and the Petit Le Mans. The Tudor Championship includes four classes of competition, again bringing together the best of both worlds. The marquee prototype category pairs the Daytona prototypes from the Rolex series with cars that competed in the ALMS P2 class, plus the revolutionary Delta Wing DWC 13. The single make prototype challenge class is virtually unchanged from 2013 when it was part of the ALMS. There are also two grand touring divisions. The former ALMS GT, recognized as the best racing of its kind in the world, continues as GT Le Mans, while the Rolex Series GT and the ALMS GTC divisions have evolved into GT Daytona, a class including vehicles similar to European GT3 machinery. Welcome back to Road Atlanta and the 17th Petit Le Mans powered by Mazda. There you see the leader in the GT Daytona class using a lot of curb down through the S's. Yeah, that's the Park Place Racing number 73 driven by Norbert Seidler right now. This is one of those teams, Dorsey, that are not a factor for the championship. They're just out for glory here today and winning one of the most prestigious endurance races in the whole world. And he's being pressured right now by Jan Halen in a second Porsche. The championship leader, Marcus Paltala, a championship leading car sits in third spot. Kind of really bouncing off those curves early in this going, you know, that sort of thing really takes its toll on a car over a 10 hour period of time. We have to watch, you know, you want to treat your car pretty nicely early in these things, not beat it all up. Well, we talked about consequences by running those curves. You can run a faster lap time, but you're right, Dorsey, does that come back to haunt you later in the race? Here's the car Calvin was just talking about. Finn Marcus Paltala, championship leader in the GT Daytona class in the Turner Motorsport Z4s. They've had quite the season, four wins on the year. Had a podium run at Coda to grab the championship lead for the first time. They were tied going into that race. Now they have a four point lead over the number 23 machine, the WeatherTech Porsche. These GTD cars are really aero slippery and they make a lot of top end speed and it surprises all the cars around them because in theory they'd be the slowest class car, but they're not slowest in the straightaway all the time. That's right, that makes them very difficult to pass. The reason they're a little bit faster down the straightaway because they don't have the downforce through the corners that makes it more slippery to cut through the air. This is a really fantastic machine. They've had a couple of wins this year, coming off a big win at Coda, that number 33 Viper. Currently in the hands of Jeroen Bleekemolen of the Netherlands. Now let's have a look at the prototype challenge class where the chassis are all identical made by the French Orica firm, all using small block Chevrolet V8 engines and all running on the same Continental tires. When you look at some of the drivers in this class, Bob, it's unbelievable. This is Jack Hawksworth, a Brit who's really made quite a name for himself in the IndyCar Championship this year. Oh, spin there. Whoa, it's the eight star number 25. You know, anytime you have a spec class car and there are, everything's equal, you need the best of the drivers to uh, be able to get the most of the car because they are equal. You have to hire really, really talented drivers. Eric Lux, he may have high, so there's a slight curve there. This is the exit of turn seven as you head onto that back straightaway. Easy to loop it around. You're in a lower gear. You're trying to jump on the power early. He just got loose there, I assume, and he may have high sided it. We'll have to wait and see. They'll wait before throwing a caution. They'll wait to see if that car can get going again. It's also the slowest corner on the racetrack. They're running about 53 mile per hour right there. Not much downforce arrow wise. So Colin Brown running second in the class. He and his teammate John Bennett were crowned driver's champion in that class at the most recent round of Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas, as we have our first full course caution. What a season the Core Autosport have had, Bob. They're going for their fourth endurance win of the year. They started off the year winning Daytona, winning Sebring. They then went to Watkins Glen six hour and won that one also. They love to cap it off here with the fourth victory in the long races. Give you a look of where the accident, well, or in this case, the incident by high side and Calvin means the car sits on the curb like a teeter totter. Can't get the wheels on the ground. Can't move it off. There's a glimpse of the crowd on a crisp day here at Road Atlanta. Be sure to check out the IMSA app with live timing and scoring, latest news, learn about teams and drivers, even watch complete races. You'll find it at the App Store and on Google Play for Android.
the season so far has been so much fun, so much of a roller coaster ride. Uh, we've had ups and downs, uh, we've had uh, one DNF, and uh, you know, right now we're sitting really actually in first place. It's been a great season so far. We have a couple of wins, a lot of podium finishes. We're leading the championship into the last race, so uh, we can't ask for much more than that. Now it's on us to, uh, to hopefully finish this off on a high note. Welcome back to Petit Le Mans. Brian Till, Tommy Kendall, Justin Bell with you now. And listen to Kuno Whitmer and Jonathan Bomarito say, we've got this, we've got that. Well, there's no we anymore because they're now been split up. That was the bombshell this week. And uh, on paper, I get it. It makes total sense. But uh, there's so many variables that you don't necessarily maybe think about. And I was talking to Jonathan right before the start. Because uh, Rob, it, they had to make new seats, new belt adjustments. The seat just got finished this morning. Um, there's there's all kinds of stuff. And then I talked to Kuno, and Kuno says, I'm actually, he says, I'm having a tough time with this emotionally. You think about every single point they've earned this year has been together. And now, theoretically, it come, could come down to a shootout between the two cars at the end. And, of course, it's all a matter of perspective because we talked with some of the other manufacturers, and they were saying, like the, one of the top Porsche Motorsport guys said, I completely concur. I understand it. We would have done the same. In fact, we have done the same. And then you got Doug Feehan over at Corvette who goes, rather imperiously, oh, of course, I would never do such a thing to my drivers. But when it comes to manufacturers, it's all about the manufacturer title. And uh, that's what we're seeing in play here. They're the ones that write the paycheck. Let's check in in the pit lane with Chris Neville. Well, Brian, it was Andy Lally and Magnus Racing that took the GTC win at Sebring this year. And Andy, you won this race back in 2010. You've had so much great experience in the endurance stuff. What do you tell the team is like the big three things they need to do right to win a race like this? Before we come into a weekend like this, we try to figure out the strengths of our car and the weaknesses of our car. Actually, more the weaknesses of our car. We need, we know that with the Porsche, we've got to keep the front radiators on. There's no contact like that. We need to set up. It's a rear engine car, so it's really easy for the rear tires to burn off on those things. So we got to set up a neutral to slightly pushy car for the beginning of our stint. And uh, we've got to be able to, to have three drivers with the right mentality to come through this thing where we're pushing at 99.9%, .9%, but really not go over that edge there right now. John's in the car right now and hauling butt and he knows he's gonna push but you know any guy that's taking an extra little chance we actually welcome that let him go let him go get the next guy let those guys wreck let us recompose under yellow and go back at it again when we get green yeah, and Andy was just telling me that John Potter behind the wheel right now this is playing out great for them because he's doing his mandatory time and then it's gonna be the pros that take it all the way to the checker flag you know, he talks about the start and trying to make sure that you survive. It is a 10 hour race. And I think as a race car driver, sometimes you lose track of that, Tommy. The green flag falls and you just want to go, go, go. But you got to conserve. We saw that on board a little bit with Nick Tandy. Nick Tandy was trying to put some of those PC cars between him and the other GTLM cars at the start. And so it's all risk reward. There's no such thing as no risk. And so you just try to manage that. Let's go to Matt Yoakum at down at Action Express. Well, Brian, coming into the event, Action Express had really four items on their to-do list. Survive practice, they did that. Then they won the pole with the five machine. And now, by starting the event, Bob Johnson, you have scored the championship. What's this mean to you, especially when you're considering looking at your team's resume of Rolex 24 wins, wins at Indy? Well, it's outstanding. I mean, we just have such a great group here. Uh, we had a, a plan right from the very beginning, back in January in Daytona. And we were able to execute with a great group of guys here. They worked extremely hard, and here we are. We, we, it's hard to believe, but it's amazing. And now the next item on the agenda, the Drivers' Championships. Exactly. That's what we're working on right now, and hopefully uh, Joel and Christian will be the champions as well. Well, the five machine said their car is really good, no complaints. Their teammate, the nine, they said simply slight understeer in that machine, Brian. I think there's more of a problem in the nine because actually four cars, we were talking about the start and getting antsy, Tommy. Four cars jumped the start, Burt Frizzell and the number nine, one of them. Uh, also the 56, the BMW, the team RLL BMW, Dirk Mueller behind the wheel, Marco Ciocci and the 49 Spirit of Race Ferrari and the number 94 Turner Motorsports BMW of Marcus Paltala. All four of those guys got a little antsy. What are you trying to make up? Yeah, like well, I said, you that, got 10 that hours 94, to go. 94, 94 championship leader. And uh, 94 arguing it's for safety reasons that he needed to do that. And I, of course, I, I, I give a little chuckle because drivers like to make excuses. But the fact of the matter is, talk about jumping the start. Look at this, three wide. Man, Delta Wing makes it three wide coming through turn 12. That is not where you want to be. Catherine Legg 
getting really, really brave. Two and a half wide, I think. <laughs> Two and a half wide. This is the delta wing. Good point. I mean, that was a very gutsy move down the inside of a very fast sweeping corner onto the straight. That car has shown really well all the way through practice. This is now the most complex sequence of the corner, Tommy, of the track, and this is where it can go wrong. And the starts are different. On the initial start, you must hold position until you cross the start-finish line, and all subsequent restarts, the team members are calling green. As soon as the green is displayed, you can be on the back straightaway, and you can yeah. commence passing. Yeah, it's go time. So there's I'm a sure. lot of advantage to be gained if you can do that well. I'm sure Marcus Baltella in the 94, arguing for safety reasons that a car slowed down in front of him, he had to move to avoid it. What, that's what you'll hear a lot. Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm down at the 35 Audi Flying Lizard pit. They've come in. Apparently, they were going to come in before you had that to yellow, and they couldn't come in. They've got a tyre problem, and he's just flat spots, and in fact, the tar car is now going away from me. So, uh, big Seth Demon at the wheel there. So, flat spotted tyres, that was that early pit stop. How many times have you told the officer when he was writing you a citation <laughs> that you were doing it for safety reasons? Yes. I've done it. Really? <laughs> How did that work? Uh, it hasn't worked out yet. <laughs> we'll see I just, I just out with argued one in court the other day and uh, didn't, didn't, didn't work go. out either. Well, guys, just a quick update. Bobby Rahal bringing the 56 car to pit lane. This is because of penalty they received for jumping at the start of the race. They lost the track position because of that penalty. So right now, just taking advantage of this caution, putting fuel and tires in that BMW. So one of the offenders has now come to pit road. It'll be interesting to see if the others come and what kind of argument plays out for the 94. Looking back into GTD a little further back, some of the best racing that we've seen in this class throughout the season. The 94 has come to pit road to serve the drive through penalty. I said at the top of the show that the penalties for getting uh, your consequences for actions early in the race will affect you at the end. And yes, the consequences are less severe the earlier your offenses or the earlier in the race you do something wrong. And the closer to the end, obviously, the more severe, less time to recover. But right now, to just to drop down a lap, it's still not a cool thing, Tommy. That, try, same time. So the 38 is in performance tech. David Ostella behind the wheel and some type of a problem with the car right up, side. Car up. They're going to raise the car up to try to get the problem taken care of on board right now. Alex Brundle in the 42, the Ligier chassis started dead last, moving forward at a very rapid rate, seventh overall right now. That car, absolutely spectacular on debut at Circuit of the Americas last race. Quickest in warm up this morning. Actually, the Delta Wing was P2, uh, but this car has shown speed at every turn except in qualifying when they had that engine problem. You see the lights on the side of the car. You'll see a number panel with the number of the car, and then right behind it, that is the leader light system. It shows where the car is in class. You saw that illuminated number seven on the side of the 42, showing that it's seventh in class. It's a great, great add to the series, and they've used it in the past with the American Le Mans series. Even better here in the Tudor United Sports Car Championship really allows the fans to get an idea where the cars are running in class. Understand it's a shifter problem on the 38. The crew will go to work under the hood, through the under tray, trying to get to that shift linkage. You mentioned those lights, good for the fans, good for the announcers too, <laughs> <laughs> with four class racing. But this is great, watching the, the leading three here. They are separated on their lap times by two hundredths to two tenths of a second. And it's really great to, to know that at the top end of the field, when you're on equal tires, when you're on equal you know, track conditions with equal drivers, this is very close racing. So I think, I hope that there's no offenses with the regulations, that they have a clean race, because this is how this race could end up. On board the 42 of Alex Brundle, up through turn three. Spectacular section of the racetrack here, down through the S's. Hats off to Catherine Legg in the Delta wing. That narrow nose of that car right behind, new innovation, running lighter with less fuel and showing what you can do with technology and running on pace. But right now, Alex Brundle looks to the inside, turn six, can he make it stay? She's turn not letting seven. him wow. have it no, easy she's not at letting all. Him have it. Uh, he kind of hip checked her up onto the curb. So impressive with what Timmy Keene has done with the Delta Wing and the team. Pass for the lead about 10 minutes ago, Ricky Taylor doing what they need to do in that number 10 Wayne Taylor racing machine. They need to win this race if they stand any chance at all of winning this championship. Little traffic down in 12. 
and he times it. He, uh, you see the five car get balked and Taylor's coming down the inside. And now with the championship in the top class for all intents and purposes being settled, these guys are going at it gloves off now. Now, obviously, until the drive time is completed, that five car has to make sure both drivers get a few minutes in. But all those guys are after pure glory, the overall win at Petit Le Mans. We saw the penalty for the number 94 BMW in the GTD category a little bit earlier. And Justin, you talked about how that could affect your strategy. Let's check in with the Turner camp with Matt. Well, the first item on the agenda, Brian, they called the driver down mentally, so the driver's focused on the task at hand. But, Will, how does that change the strategy for the next hour or so? Yeah, you know, when you're, uh, when you were, when we're up front, it was a little bit easier because we kind of controlled the pace and saw what everybody else is doing. Now it's a little bit of a game of catch up. But again, I got some of the some of the best drivers in the business in the car, and they are calm and they realize that it's a 10-hour race. And uh, you know, we'll hope for another yellow to get us bunched back up. But I have confidence in the guys and the team to get us going. And 10 hours is a long time, and uh, we'll just see what happens. As far as the car is concerned, how pleased is he with it? Uh, you know, the uh, IMSA hit us with a pretty big balance of performance adjustment a couple races ago, and uh, it really gave an advantage to the Porsches. As you can see, they're running up front right now. Um, we don't have the fastest car. We have a good car, but um, we're, we're a little bit behind the eight ball here. So it's all going to be about the pit stops and being smooth and calling the right strategies and being there at the end. And I hope we're there at the end in front of the, uh, the, uh, the Porsche and the Ferrari. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Brian? Thanks, Matt. That 94 BMW has had a lot of balance of performance or adjustment of performance changes throughout the year. Almost 200 pounds of weight added. And yet the last three races, two victories and a third place finish at Circuit of the Americas. Porsche's up front in class right now in GTD. Awesome stuff. Going after that 73 car, taking the position, the park place car. Porsche expert Norbert Siedler behind the wheel of the 73, Jan Halen in the 58. And this snow racing team really joined with Dempsey Racing, running the two cars together under the same tent. Having two cars, the ability to change information back and forth and exchange that information, I think has helped both the 27 and the 58. Yen Halen really showing what this team can do. A lot of the other Porsche teams kind of languishing back in the pack and qualifying, but these two teams showing that you can still run up front in a Porsche. Yeah, Halen's been showing a lot of speed the second half of the year, and uh, now they've elected to go with just two drivers, which is gonna is a tall ask. Uh, the cool weather will help, but you look at the park place car that has four drivers. One of the big reasons behind that in GTD is because of the driver classifications. You've got you've got gold drivers and silver drivers, and if you can't find a silver, like Madison Snow runs really really well. If you can't find another silver that can complement the team, I, you choose to do what they did and go with just the two. But yeah, they're, they're going to be some tired boys at the end. 38 still in pit lane, Andrew. Yeah, he is, but he's just about to leave now. Uh, Daniel Ostella reporting that he was hit from behind. This seems to affect the gear linkage system and uh, also some of the bodywork rubbing on the right rear tyre. They've gone out again, but I think it might be a, another exploratory lap from uh, this car, which is obviously troubled early on. He may be heading back out. We had also heard radio traffic say go behind the wall. So that team trying to diagnose the problem, maybe another reconnaissance lap to see if it's going to work for him now, but this battle continues to rage up front in the GT Daytona category. Norbert Siedler out in front in that beautiful number 73. It's great, though, seeing the Viper, Jerome Bleakmoller, right in the middle there. And that is a closely knit pack. That's five cars racing within, a, I mean, literally on the track, one and a half seconds apart from front to fifth. And of course, there is a rhythm coming in. I, I, this is earlier than we often see here at Petit Le Mans. A nice rhythm in class. They're free of traffic. I mean, I say that the, the leaders will probably come around in the next lap or two. But it's a really nice moment. It allows the drivers to, to focus on their race and what they're doing. And uh, quite a luxury here on this very demanding racetrack with a number of cars. And the action. I thought you is, said it was settling in. I said it's a rhythm. I didn't say what rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. Wow, they're going at it. And look at uh, four Porsches and a Viper. So obviously the Porsches are much better off uh, competitive balance wise than they've been for most of the year. Understand the shifting problem may be fixed on the 38, but they've got to get some body work taken care of. These guys may need some body work. Siebler, Siebler in the 73, Jan Halen in the 58 from Snow Racing, that white and red Porsche right behind that orange number 73. These two guys going at it. Jerome Bleekemolen in the white Viper sitting just behind him. And I feel like maybe he's biding his time a little bit, Tommy, and saying, go, go have at it, guys. 
Well, I mean, we don't know. Obviously, he'll, he'd like to lead if he could, but I think he's probably content to leave a few car lengths and let those guys beat on each other. And the, the one possible weak link on the Porsches is over the, the full fuel stint as they've known to be a little bit harder on the rear tires, whereas the Viper has shown, you know, better better pace over the full stint. You see the, the lead car starting to fishtail a little bit, putting the power down. But uh, those guys are under a blanket. Now, you look at the back of that pack, and you, you see Mario uh, Farnbacher. Super uh, Mario. Who, yeah, Super Mario, who qualified. Actually, Davis. Or, no, Mario is in the car. I was reading the monitor wrong. So Mario's in the car. He's what you call, uh, Andy Lally would call a sneaky silver. And the key in these classes where you have the driver ratings is you want to find the, all the golds are world class, but you want to find some silvers. And so they're, all these guys are harvesting the uh, Porsche Cup from Europe as we see the Z two different class Z4s go at it. But uh, the sneaky silver is what uh, what you want. And Mario Fonbacher has been qualifying that car more often than not that tells you he's, he's plenty fast. The battle continues to rage up front. Ricky Taylor leads overall. Colin Brown leading in prototype challenge right now. This is one of the best battles on the racetrack. Jack Hawksworth, who started on the pole in prototype challenge, has fallen back to third. The number 27, the black and silver Dempsey Racing Porsche being piloted right now by Andrew Davis. He has his mirrors full of that sneaky silver driver, Mario Farnbacher. And here comes the leading group, which of course has just upset the rhythm. I said they'll be there within a lap. and. Uh, Everybody right now, they've got the best drivers in the cars in front. The prototype drivers are driven with them all year. They've got a pretty good degree of confidence, Tommy, working their way through this traffic. And of course, tires are in good shape. It, this is solid driving. That was great driving by uh, the leading GT. And this is the hard part. Even with the speed difference between the prototype and the GTDs, it's not easy to get around maybe one car between turn one and turn six. And you got to have a lot of patience. And it, it works both ways. You, you you need some cooperation from the GTD car. I talked to Andy Lally, and he said, if if I, I know the guy's coming up on me, if it's one of the crazy guys, he specifically mentioned Yakuman. He said, when I see them coming, I act like I'm out of control. I use all the curb, and I slide the car to discourage them from sticking the nose down into the S's. So uh, it, it, you think they don't know, but uh, if you've treated them poorly, these guys have memories like elephants. And the same thing goes with the GT Le Mans. They got to worry about passing slower cars and letting faster cars by. Well, I was going to say, you have driven both prototypes and in the GT category, so you know what it's like. Brian Sellers right there in the turquoise and blue, number 17 runs second in the GT Le Mans category right now. The 911 of Nick Tandy started from the pole and has leapt out in front. Right behind Giancarlo Fisichella in the number 62 Ferrari. He's hanging on the back of Brian Sellers. Credit to that Team Falcon Tire GTLM program that tire think about this it's a one car team that means they've got one car to develop that tire with other teams in gtlm they've got multiple teams to develop the michelin tires that the majority of them run it's a little david and goliath deal but uh, guess what david won this race last year for team falcon tire so uh and they're really good here you yeah. said it i think last year sitting in this very booth i said that was a breakout for me a breakout race for Oh, look, yeah, great driving there. Uh, you know, a really, uh, for Brian Sellers, it was a breakout race. And here again, the qualifying was so strong. And you know what? Imagine if they won the championship for Porsche in that little green car. That would be, I mean, Brian just put his hands together and looked like he was praying when I said that on the grid just a minute ago. So long way to go, but they're motivated. Well, and I, I couldn't have been more impressed watching Nick Tandy in that Falcon car last year. Obviously, he's in the factory car this year. But uh, that, he drove like you couldn't believe in those final stints. You know, he was leading after that last yellow, and I figured, watch these guys swallow him up, and it didn't happen. So uh, it's a wild card in that championship battle for sure, the manufacturer's championship battle. The Tudor United Sports Car Championship has been awesome this year, especially in GTD and GTLM. The number three Corvette, you were on board with Antonio Garcia, and you look at the four cars or the three cars in front of him, that's all for position. It's the proverbial blanket that you throw over them, I and you've got a Ferrari, a Porsche, a Viper, and a Corvette. Four different manufacturers right there, running third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and a different pole sitter in all 10 rounds. And just to reset the various championships in GT Le Mans, you have the two Viper drivers are tied, but they're split in different cars. So one of them needs to finish on the podium. The number three Corvette, if they want to win, that three Corvette needs to win and have a Viper finish off the podium. You switch to the driver, the manufacturer's championship, Viper and Porsche are dead even. So whoever finishes in front of the other, top finishing 
of each brand will determine manufacture. So you have all these permutations that are uh, the drivers are aware of and they're being reminded of by the pit boxes. So I got two of you sitting here, so let's split the strategy. I'll give you the business hat, Tommy. I'll give you the driver hat, Justin. You get split from your teammate. One of you is going to win the championship. One of you is not. Business side of it, Tommy? Well, the business side, you, obviously you want the team and the brand and the car to, and the one of your drivers to win the championship. But consider this scenario. You come down to the end. It's Vipers running one, two, Porsche in third. You tell your drivers, hey, guys, we just need to keep those Porsches behind us to win the manufacturer's championship. The Vi guy in the second Viper is like, I got to get around that Viper to win the championship. I just, I think I covered the driver part for you there. Yeah, Justin, I but. mean, I was, I was just <laughs> thinking, that's fine. I feel like I'm in the pit lane again. Um, drive manufacturers is all about we, drivers is all about me. And I, I, even though you love your teammate and you do well, it needs to be you. In the off season, if you need to negotiate contracts, it's about how you finished in the championship. Having a championship title, I mean, how many of people have finished second? And we talked, joked about it yesterday. Tommy has won so many races, he can't tell you how many times he finished second, but he also can't remember them. And that's what it's like. You don't, second is fantastic. It means a lot to you, but it doesn't mean anything to anyone yeah, else. It means nothing to anyone else. It may be your mom at home or something like that. You saw the speed differential between GT Le Mans and GT Daytona as the GT Le Mans battle went past the 94 BMW down the back straightaway. It's not that great down the straightaway. They don't just motor by. That's no. what makes it so difficult, especially around a racetrack like this. GT Le Mans cars have more downforce, bigger tires. They're, they come off the corner harder, but top speed, actually the Porsches are quicker than some of the GT Le Mans cars down the straight. Right now at this stage of the race, I was, we were watching one of the Michelin uh, tire engineers was doing track temperature, Brian, and track temperature uh, just at the start of the race was 73 degrees. It was 104 on Thursday afternoon. Wow. So they have a big difference. If the wind, it's, for those of you sitting at home, you can't feel it, you may look at the trees in the background. There's a, a little breeze, a light breeze, but it's a very cool breeze. If that maintained during the afternoon, the track temperature would be more restrained in, in how high it goes up. But it'll probably get into the early 90s if by, by mid-late afternoon. There was three different classes of cars that just went by. Prototype Challenge, GTLM, and GT Daytona. And look at this battle, the 912 Porsche. Michael Christensen trying to get around Fisichella in the 62 Ferrari just in front, trying to use some GT Daytona traffic to get that done. And this battle continues to stay red hot. Meanwhile, in Prototype Challenge, Colin Brown out in front. What happened to our pole sitter, Jack Hawksworth? Andrew Marriott, he's all the way back to seventh. That's right, I just talked to Paul Gentle Lotes, his team boss, he said it was all on the restart after uh, we went green again. He'd never done one of those at uh, Road Atlanta before. He got really caught out, just not used to it. And uh, you would have thought he might have done a few in India, of course. But anyway, Jack Horsworth has been told by Gentle Lotes, he's keeping cool, we've got the pace, don't hurry, and of course, Young Hawksworth from uh, Yorkshire in England has never done a race of this distance before, so he, he's got to get the long distance head on, and that's what Gentilosi has put on him. Well, it is kind of a different ball game, except for the fact that these races now seem to be just 10 hour, 12 hour, 24 hour sprint races. But I guess the thing that is different is the mindset. I don't have to push too hard right now. I've got time. I was chuckling to myself. I can't think of a more zen-like individual to <laughs> preach calmness than Paul Gentilosi. <laughs> I mean, he is, he does from in profile look like Buddha, but, but, but not, uh, not in attitude. I love I, you, Paul. <laughs> we all love you, Paul, but I don't know anyone as competitive as Paul. Paul has also won Daytona overall in, in a Nissan, so he, yeah. he knows what he's talking about, but uh, that's not what he's known for amongst yeah, his, you know, his uh, colleagues. Now, his this peers. is what happens between the two different classes. You talked about greater speed through the corners. You saw the Viper get held up behind GT Daytona traffic. He also has one of the Mazda prototypes, the number 70 in there. And that's what happens. You get to these high speed apexes and all of a sudden the differential between the cars becomes very obvious. And that's a that's a really fast place and it is really only one line. So if you can get all the way there, you lunge down there, but sometimes you, you're lunging and then you realize they don't see you or they're coming down and then you got to back it all the way out. And you, you, so you, you double down for the aggressive move and then you, you, it, it kills all your momentum. You saw the BMW make a run on them, as, uh, but not getting around. On board with Sylvain Tremblay on the number 70 Mazda, continuing to develop that Sky Active diesel. And, I know a lot of people look just at the results, but that's not what Mazda's looking at. They're looking at the development and how it's progressing. And when you think that 
90 plus percent of the parts in that engine are basically right out of the streetcar. It's very, very impressive what they've done. It is, and it's, it's uh, I gotta give them credit for being willing to go through the pains of development in front of everyone. You know, when you look at Audi and how they do it, they like they only bring it out when the thing's totally done. Here they're like, hey, you learn the most in yep. real conditions. And so you look at how far that car has come over the course of the year, it's an amazing progression in development. They've pulled the curtain back. They let everybody see what's going on. And, and that means you see the problems that they have, both development-wise and also they've had some problems on the racetrack. They actually had problems here in qualifying with the sister car, the 07. I believe it was Tristan Nunez behind the wheel in qualifying. So he has a problem. He spins. All right, no contact. He's going to try to get the car restarted. It sat there for a while. And then the nine car around the corner, boom. And now this looks like he just ran right into him. Now, if you put yourself in the Action Express car, they were they were they had had some red flags. Didn't have probably tire temperature. He came over the hill from where he was sitting. He probably couldn't tell if the car was blocking the racing line or off. And so I think he felt, oh no, here, there's a car block in the road. I have to stop once he got the tires locked. It, I think it was a little bit of deer in the headlights, but I think for the most part, it, it, from where he was sitting, the car probably looked like it was blocking the whole track, and they had to stop. I just think that both teams mechanics were sitting there go watching it going we've just we got three <laughs> seven minutes of qualifying left we've we've been unscathed for all the bad weather and everything and here we are so uh, both crews had a lot of work to do last night and I, I hope there's no impact on their race today but you're right Brian this this car amazing development I love the way they're bringing up young drivers um, Sylvain Treblay is obviously not one of those. He's one of the people imparting his knowledge to a younger generation. He's an experienced driver. He's mature, and it's really nice to see them, you know, great young guys like Tristan, and they're really learning a lot. They are also in the most beautiful car on the racetrack. It I think is, and the fans love it. It's just a great looking, great looking race car. It's that diesel technology that Audi uses. They're trying to emulate that. Nick Tandy trying to bring a victory not only a Petit Le Mans, but a manufacturer's victory here in the 911 Porsche. There's a look at how GT Le Mans stacks up right now. Tandy, Sellers, Porsches 1-2, Giancarlo Fisichella in the Ferrari, then another Porsche 912. Understand prototypes should be pitting in the next lap or two. You look at the clock, 43 minutes. So far here at the 17th running of Petit Le Mans, you'd expect 45 to 50 minutes for a prototype. Understand the 10 car may be one of those be the first in. That's Ricky Taylor. You said you heard Stay out, stay out. Well, if he's on reserve, they're gonna go one more. They're all right, ready trying to look maybe to the future and say, how far can we go? I mean, you, a lot of times on that first pit stop. You're gonna pit this lap, pit this lap. So Reduce pit. tires and fuel, you will stay in the car. So he'll double, but a lot of times on the first stop, Tommy, you stop short just to make sure. Yeah, just to make sure that you wait. Because sometimes in practice, you don't get a great read on mileage. Now they have onboard telemetry, so they're monitoring the actual real-time fuel flow. But you always want to err on the side of caution the first time to make sure what you think the consumption is is actual. And you can only do that by seeing how much it takes on that first stop. And as we know, every time you do in your final driver's briefing, they'll say, they'll show you a track map. And I know they got the telemetry. They'll say, if your fuel like reserve comes on before this line, you come in. Yes. After this point, you can stay out. And it's a pretty much an absolute. And I guess they were just the other side of that line. Well, it's not Road America that's almost four miles long. It's not Le Mans. It's two and a half miles. So that reserve is going to take you a little bit further as far as lap number wise. You saw in the number five, the red and white Corvette just approaching 45 minutes. That is Joao Barbosa, your second place runner. And in 15 seconds, Joao Barbosa will claim his share of the driver's championship. He will have done his requisite 45 minutes. And he can say, I am a 2014 champion. Christian Fittipaldi will need to do his 45 minutes. And then they will share that driver's championship together. The 10 is come to pit road. Didn't take him long to get around. And it's a pretty substantial lead that he had, almost seven seconds. Now the five car stayed out. The 45 minutes just clicked off, literally as they were passing pit in. We were told that Zhao was going to stay in for a double stint. Let's see if they change that. We're going to go down and get a pit report on that 10 car. And Ricky Taylor enjoyed about a six second lead there before hitting pit road. Now, simply their game plan is Ricky will stay in the car for one more stint. Then he'll hand the car over to his brother, Jordan. And then at this juncture, 
Max Angelelli is expected to go a triple stint, and then he'll be done for the Come event. Back to Remember, three. they're still on qualifying tires. They're expecting, after they put the sticker tires on, to get a good indication just how track conditions are, because like Chris Neville documented earlier in the event, we're looking at about a 20 degree swing from Ready. Max. He's got another ride. He's away. Ricky Taylor, Jordan Taylor, looking for another victory. The only one they've had this year was back at Detroit. They talk about hard fought. There were a lot of hard feelings after that one, too, with the number five car, Joao Barbosa, in that car at the end of Detroit. A lot of rubbing, a lot of banging, a lot of pushing into walls and such. Interesting that the five would say, we're going to double stint our driver. Why wouldn't you get your 45 done for one and immediately put your other driver well, in? Well, here they come, and I'm going to be interested to see if they switch that up, because until Fittipaldi gets his 45 minutes in, he doesn't have a share of that championship. So. Overall race strategy, it makes sense to double Zhao here. Sure. But now that but they thought they were gonna have to pit before the 45. Now that they don't, be interesting to see if they switch that up on the fly. Mike Rockenfeller in the number 90 right behind. Rockenfeller gained some ground on that in lap right there with him as they roll down pit road. Spirit of Daytona Corvette pulls off first. The five down at the end of pit lane, a little longer roll. I do and there is Christian going in. And they're sticking with the original game plan. We talked a lot about how they were going to double stint, but now you see they are going to go with the driver change because they made it past that 45 minute mark. Earlier, they thought around 40 minutes in, they would have to hit pit road. But now since they made it to the 45 minute mark, they can do the driver change. They've already completed one driver, completing the task. And he's away completing the task so he can lock in his championship. Now, Fittipaldi's away. Maybe Mike Rockenfeller stayed in the 90. You would think that you would double stint that first driver if you're not trying to do the points like the five. That full course caution that we had earlier certainly helped extend that period for Joao Barbosa. It got him to the 45 minute mark. And you saw that the Action Express guys, even with the driver change, were able to get out with a bigger gap than they came in. So it didn't slow him down. Chris? Well, Oswaldo Negri was also in on that last pit stop when we were watching the 90. He stayed behind the wheel, and it's going to be a long day for both he and John Pugh. Just a handful of drivers here are doing it with two drivers. Their team's doing this race with two drivers. That's one of them. And last week, Oswaldo Negri did a triathlon, guys. Also, the 42 car in the Oak Racing car. This team has been plagued with mechanical issues this week, and they had an engine failure earlier in the week, clutch issues in qualifying. That's why this car had to start at the back of the pack, but they made a nice run up into the top five. They faded a little bit, so they're making a couple of tire uh, air pressure adjustments on this stop, but Alex Brundle staying behind the wheel. Alex Brundle knows this Ligier chassis so well. He's done a lot of the development with it, and they'll get the balance sorted out. They were really my pick for the pole before they had the engine problems, and in, re in reality, it was, ah, uh, they've got a problem on the stop now. What's going on? Jack goes back on, car comes back up in the air, and they're going for the engine cover. We're on the right-hand side. Now on the left as well. They must have seen something, guys, on the telemetry or something while they were doing that because they were pretty swift to, to get back in there. Number 91 Viper was just in. They did routine service and were back out. Is that part of the plenum that they're... Yeah, they're, uh, you can see them wiggling that. It looks like they might have a loose hose clamp. An or air something. leak or something like that. Crew going to work there. The 0-1 rolls down pit lane. Second place when Memo Rojas hit the lane, Chris. And Rojas pretty much been spending uh, about this entire stint back in fifth place, saying that the car is pretty loose. So checking in with that team, they were going to make an air pressure adjustment to try and get the balance a little bit better on this car. But Memo Rojas, this whole Ganassi team, their first time at Petit Le Mans. They raced here last year in the Rolex Series, won that race. And Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas saying that they just had an incredible car that day. This weekend, still trying to find the sweet spot with this new Ford. The Ford gets better and better every weekend. I know Mike Shank did some testing up at Mid-Ohio the week before the Coda race. And what they were working on was drivability and exhaust systems on that Ford power plant. And it seems like they've gotten rid of most of the turbo boost. That is huge. This is huge as well. Alex Brundle still sitting in his pit box. The crew going to work. This is from qualifying. You see the flashing red light on the dash. You never want to see that. 
No, they, they, they had the alarms program. It was oil pressure in this case, uh, and so another an engine failure for that new car. This is a real shame because that 42 car has been Mr. Excitement. It, it looks like it might not be terminal. That 73 Porsche. Oh, oh, and it gets stuck in the oh, gravel. Yeah, you can't drive oh, into the gravel that here. That was avoidable. He did not need he, to drive in there. He was rear wheels on the grass. Oh. And for Norbert Seidler, if he doesn't know this racetrack well, if he's never walked around it, if he hasn't stepped into that gravel trap, he may not have known how deep it is, but it's like quicksand. As soon as you're there, you're there. You're not going anywhere. Yeah, that is very frustrating. And we were just watching it. We heard him on the radio now. Um, interesting moment to have a full course yellow because there are a few teams who have not pitted yet. And it's going to be a nice track I'm really position sorry, issue guys, for some of them. But that 250, I had a tire puncture. And I couldn't hold it. He says that he did have a tire puncher on his car, which could have affected him. So it looks like the number four Corvette involved. Maybe that's what cut that tire down. Hard to see. It gets so busy down in 10A and 10B. And then, and then he drove into yeah, the gravel. You don't the... see that very often. And in the open, you said, I guarantee you, we'll talk about things in the first hour that will maybe affect people the whole rest of the day or, or affect their finish at the end. So now they got the yellow out quickly. So what he's hoping is that they tug him out of there before he loses a lap. But I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. 42 heads back out. We talked about maybe an air leak in the plenum system or whatever, a turbocharged power plant, Honda power plant. If you get an air leak and you're not getting that exhaust, that turbocharger pressure back into the engine, you're just not going to get the horsepower, Chris. Well, Brian, I think you're headed in the right direction there. I checked in with the team and they said it's a turbo issue with that car. That's pretty much all they told me. But, you know, this team, this chassis, so fast at Circuit of the Americas when they introduced it just a couple weeks ago. But they uh, couldn't pull off the victory there and obviously more problems this week. And so a very fast car, a team that's just ready to break through and get another victory this year. But today it's going to be a long 10 hours for them. Such huge disappointment for this team. This car shows so much promise. This full course caution and the pit stops put the Delta wing into the lead. Catherine Legg behind the wheel of the number zero, that very unique chassis design. Out in front right now, they've not pitted. And Andrew, we understand they don't need to right now. They're getting ready to pit now, but I think they've done three more laps than uh, any of the other prototypes, or most of the prototypes. So they're getting great fuel mileage. Add that, that up over 10 hours. But you know, this car could really be a contender. They've been working away at this machine. They've changed the aero package. It's going quicker than it's ever done. Could this be the big, big sensation of this year's Petit Le Mans? Well, I'm just still waiting here. The Delta Wing, of course, still hasn't come in. I don't want to get struck by lightning here, but you see, I've never been a fan. I, I'm saying this on air, live. I've never been a fan of this, but I have a begrudging respect for the technology in action and it, they have worked on it, they've never given up on it, and it's just got faster and faster. So, still not my dream car, but I am, I'm impressed. The, the three lap advantage, consider this scenario, yellow with 55 minutes to go at the end of the race. The only car that can go that far, apparently, is the Delta Wing. Well, you talk about the changes that they've made to it. They've added some aerodynamic devices to the front, and also, you see them right there, on the front of the delta wing and on the dorsal fin on the back they've made some changes as well and all of that has given this car a lot more downforce and consequently it's given the drivers a lot more confidence you see the dorsal fin there and that little almost horizontal stabilizer in the back it certainly looks a lot more racy now it looks like we, maybe we have preconceptions we just think you need wings to go fast and they they proved that was actually not the case for most of their development but now just being able to to, to maybe adjust it, change the central pressure in the car, Tommy, make it a little bit more stable. Um, Andrew, they, they've certainly got a lot of development underway, haven't they? They have, but they've got a bit of a problem now because uh, obviously the pits are still closed. I just talked to Alan Muggleston as the technical director here, and I said, have you got enough fuel to uh, hang on and open the pits? And he waved his hand about in one of those movements and said, well, I'm not really sure it's going to be very close indeed. They need the pits to open again right now. 
That's interesting. We heard a little while ago they didn't need to pit, and now they're saying we may have to take emergency service. You can come in with the pits are closed, and you can take a splash of fuel enough to give you a lap or two behind the safety car. But if you do that, you obviously have to come back in and then do your full service, and it's going to drop you considerably back in the order. There's a penalty to be paid if you take emergency service. To explain to you some of the dynamics, uh, because when that Delta Wing came out, I all, like all we couldn't wrap our brains around it. And I, I read an interview with Ben Bowlesby, and and the philosophy is the rear, all the weight almost is on the rear tires. The rear tires, the rear brakes do the most work. The front, it's almost like imagine you're you have a trailer and there's no weight on the tongue of the trailer and it, and it leads the thing around and all the weight is on the rear axle of the trailer. This is like a trailer with no tow vehicle and the front wheels are just kind of holding the front of the car up and turning it a little bit. You see how low that front thing, uh, front uh, splitter is because there's no weight up there. You, they, the static height, look how low that is. The static height of it can be right on the deck and so they're obviously constrained a little bit at some point the front tires will slide so they're trying to pin it to the ground a little more but relative to the rear it's like 80 percent of the weight is on the rear tires and the good news is we understand the pits will be open this time by so for Catherine leg couldn't come any earlier that's a good good word to hear from the pit lane that she'll be able to stop and get the fuel that they seem to need impressive though timmy keen leaves Ganassi Racing and heads over to Delta Wing mid-season and they've made some great improvements and it's funny how that works. Well, yeah, well, and it's, it, the other thing is it's not saying anything bad about the people that were there before. It's a fresh take on things and sometimes you need that. Well, you, a guy like Tim Keene, who's been, you know, they're the Ganassi, a championship machine yeah. and just people and processes and approaches and so forth. I, they, they made strides with the car before, but yeah. it, it's not a surprise that this is yeah. uh, its best showing. On board the 10 of Ricky Taylor, being shown in second right now. They have already done their first pit stop. And, you know, this is a team that they've run consistently all year long. They've had some problems. They had a problem at Coda when they were hit by the 42 at the start. That set them back. They were hit at Indianapolis, and that set them back. But you look at their results for the year, a lot of top five finishes. They had the victory at Detroit. They just needed another win or two or some bad luck to have gone away and they would have been a little closer in the championship. Delta Wing is in. Yeah, the Delta Wing is in. Catherine Leg stays in the car. Those little skinny front tires that look as if they've come off a little Citroen 2CV are being changed right now. But this is looking good for this car. It's a real break for them. They were genuinely worried they were going to have to come in while the pits were still closed. They got the break and out it goes. Nice clean pit stop, which you expect from a pit run by Tim Keane. So, uh, well, we'll be following this story, boys. Well, I know that our international fans will know what a Citron 2CV is, but I'm not sure there are many in America that would. The two chevaux. <laughs> Don't worry, you made. Yeah, yeah. In all the auctions that I do, believe me, I've seen some weird and wonderful tires and cars. Uh, Look uh, at those. There are your front tires off the Delta Wing. Uniquely made con compound construction for the Delta Wing. Uh, they'd never, you'd think, uh, my obvious question when I saw these tires was, oh, you got that from MotoGP, did you? And they were like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so different, Justin, that's why you don't, you're not an engineer. But, you know, it looks like the same. Now, that, that, the fuel advantage is going to multiply because they can go, say, 53 minutes from now. They're going to go to an hour 53. The cars that stopped at 45, the Daytona prototypes, they're going to be stopping in about a half an hour. And so that, that fuel advantage could multiply if you have a long green flag run here. And now back in GT Le Mans, this is going to shake things up because we saw the four Corvette and the 91 Viper pitted before the yellow. Virtually all of the other contenders were still out. They're going to come in. They'll have more fuel and tires, but they'll be at the back of the line. So you're going to have the four car is going to lead. Uh, it's going to be four of the 91 and then the BMW, the three cars that made their stops. On board with Giancarlo Fisichella. Under yellow, it's going to Looks like he's going to get his drink bottle, take a little sip. And that's one of the things that's important. These drivers, you'll look at all the devices that they have, radio wires, drink tubes, and everything else. It's changed a lot over the years. I remember the first drink bottle that I ever had. Somebody said, well, let's take a windshield washer squirter, and we can try to use that. I mean, they're, but they're so developed now, the bottles have a little placeholder down in the bottom. I mean, the cars are designed with a lot more driver comfort in mind than I think they've been in 
And back the, in the olden days when the, I ran. The windshield washer serves two purpose. Not only do you not have to suck all the, the fluid through the hose, it also breaks the siphon because all of yep. us that have driven that way, you get a nice cool drink and then you hit that brake zone at the end of the straightaway and it just starts pumping uncontrollably into your mouth. All of a sudden and, you're uh, drowning. Yes. Zero nine prototype challenge contender on pit road. Should be a routine stop. Duncan Indy, Bruno Jincara, David Hanemeyer Hansen. And Hanemeyer Hansen over here running the endurance races. Won at Le Mans this year in the GTE AM category. Such an impressive driver, especially when you figure that he doesn't do this for a living, but he attacked sports car racing about three or four years ago and set his sights on becoming one of the best that you could be at his level of sport. He's certainly done that. Very impressive guy both in prototypes and in the GT category. Hose, pull that hose, hard. No, no, clear high, clear high. Wasn't the quickest stop in the world, but... At this point in the race, yeah. under yellow, one of the few cars in, you can take your time, but they need to get they need to get sharp by the end, because if you have one uh, in that dash for cash in the last couple hours, that every second will matter. Absolutely, now the 25 is in. There'll be a driver change there. That's Eric Lux. Now remember, that car lost a lap when it was high centered. Um, the fact that they're pitting now means they're not going to get the the lead uh, uh, lead lap or, or wave around. Wave around that. Yep. So they're going to they're going to have to continue to work to try to get that lap back. And of course, Tommy, right now, behind watching the shots, great. We're seeing the cars there in the pit lane. We see the mechanics just to the left. You can see all the rig, fuel rigs, and that's where all the pit boxes are for our viewers at home. Obviously, you know that. But what you don't see so well is the strategists and the engineers at work. Go, right go, now, go. Tommy, this yellow caused this break in the flow, and they're able to start analyzing, working back now from the just over nine hours, under nine hours to go. And that's what they have to do every time they recalibrate and reset. It's, it's actually an art. It's a race winning art in itself, isn't it? Well, they write their own their software available and they, they write their own software to based on how many laps, based on how much tire de degradation of, is in effect at various tracks. If you get a yellow here, it's, you know, they're thinking on their own, but they've developed software to, to process all of that information at once and say, should you pitch, should you stay out? That is quite, uh, I mean, right now, what would you think if you were in, in, in for me, in the, the leading peak half, especially for Ricky Taylor, he has, it's got to be firing a bullet out of a gun, I think, at the top of the P class right now, don't you? Time to go. Well, and, and he's been in the car since the start. He took, made the pass for the lead and, uh, and pulled away from Jao Barbosa. Now we're seeing all the, the GT Le Mans leaders, including the 911, come in. Those three cars that stopped will, will cycle past. And let's see, they're doing a driver change. Bergmeister going in the 911, Tandy out. Right behind the team car, the 912. And Brian, we got a lot of GT traffic down here. Both classes, both GT Le Mans and GTD. The 62 car, the Risi Competizione car, running third for most of this first run. Giancarlo Fisichella handing over to Pierre Caffer and checked in with Rick Mayer, the engineer on this car, and asked him how it was. And he said, that first run, absolutely. We got our pressures wrong. So they're hoping to get their tire pressures right and try and challenge here in this next run here. But still a lot of traffic down in pit lane. Man, it is busy down there. Rick saying they got their pressures wrong, but that 62 was running pretty well. They were running in the top three. Matt? Brian, when the season began, team manager for Action Express, Gary Nelson's motto was simply expect to win. And, and they've done that on the racetrack. Three wins in Joao Barbosa, the biggest win of all, the championship. What means the championship to you most as far as that level of accomplishment? I mean, it means a lot. To be the first champion of the Twitter United Sports Car Series, it's just unbelievable. This is a new era of sports car. It's been great. I'm very proud to be a uh, part of it. I couldn't have done without Action Express. Also, congratulations to Action Express for their team win. And uh, it's just an amazing group of guys. Christian is in the car, hopefully. He's going to be able to do his 45 minutes and get uh, his championship as well. But uh, everything has been uh, a dream year. Now we can go actually racing. We still have the Patron Cup to, to go after. So everything is looking good from now on. And you mentioned that once Christian completes his stint and he scores his championship, now you can flip the switch and, and then it's definitely game on for the win. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was super conservative initially with traffic. It's very, very tough out there. And um, we want to get the points out of the way. We want to get the championship. Uh, we're really proud with the support of Chevy, uh, ECR engines, and uh, Continental tires. Everybody's done a tremendous job this year. 
we just have to finish it up. We have one more championship to go after the Patron Cup, so we're looking forward to go, and we actually can go racing now. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Brian? Understand we'll do one more lap and then go back to green here at Road Atlanta, but you heard him say Christian Fittipaldi needs to do his 45 minutes. Yeah, I just want to quickly go back to Jao. I drove with him in the Mosler when he first came on the scene here in the States for Warren Mosler. The first year we went to Barber, we won a couple of races that year, and he's one of those teammates, and you go, I haven't got a clue who you are, but why are you so fast? And, you know, <laughs> and, and suddenly you... Fastest guy you've never heard of. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And I said at that time, I said, I really hope that he gets picked up. Warren gave us a great chance, gave him a great chance in coming over and being seen. And I thought, you know what? He's as fast as anyone in the pit lane. I hope he gets a shot. And, the, you know, someone put the, his bullet in their gun and they, he fired it in the right direction. And the kid is, he's not a kid, he's our age, but he's really, really quick and couldn't be more gentlemanly about it. Yeah, go for race driver. Talk about Action Express, 100 and 101st start today with the two cars. The five car, the only car to complete every lap in first and second in the Tequila Patron North America Endurance Cup standings. That's for the four endurance races that we run this year. When he said it really hasn't been a good year, look at that. I mean, uh, it's a total sweep. What's you know, first and second in the Endurance Cup so far? You've been involved with teams like that. You know, Elton Sawyer came in, kind of redirected things, built up a program, and you just, you feel it when you're down there. Everybody is singularly focused on the success of the team and you're, you when you go down there and you see it you just you just feel something special when you stand in that in in that paddock and for people that think the name elton sawyer sounds familiar he was quite a driver in on the stock car side of yep. things you're like what does he know about road racing well team team dynamics are very similar no matter what type of racing it is and uh, they've built a great organization interesting seeing the full lock there being able to apply so easily in the bmw as they're warming up the tires remember They've got fresh tires on, out on the track, and the track temperature is still, I'm sure Chris can give us an update on that in a minute, but the track temperature is still down, so you, you're able with less resistance to, to actually work your front tires, and it comes in really quickly in that driver, and you're just waiting for that magic feel, aren't you, T, when you, you go, oh, okay, the grip's there. Well, and something, I, I said the Corvette will cycle to the front. Both Corvettes stopped under that yellow, so now the Viper green, is... Green, uh, green, oh, green, 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 green. A little stack up, and once again, you said it, Tommy, when the green flies on a restart, it's go time, and that's exactly what you saw kind of taking place some games down the hill into 12. And uh, Rojas yes. had to light up the, uh, the tires under, with the brake because the, the car in front of him stopped, and the other Action Express went leaping around to take a few minutes to get tires up to temperature. A little lock up in front from the prototype challenge car. That's the yellow car on the left. You can see the double roll cage on it and an open top. It'll let you know that it is a prototype challenge machine as you ride on board with Memo Rojas in the 01 from Ganassi Racing. Ford EcoBoost power in the back of that Riley chassis. Yeah, for, for those of you that have never had the luxury of driving on a racetrack, a car, as you're trying to bring these tires up to speed, you're also worrying about carrying pace and not getting overtaken. And as you can see, you're having to do your own fair share of overtaking here. But it is, it comes in every corner. The car's going to feel faster and faster you with more grip. Uh, but meanwhile, you get caught up with a little bit PC traffic and they've cleared off into the woods in front of you. So uh, track position here, keeping the same pace as the guy in front, keeping him within the window is, is going to be very important all the way through this. You got an idea of the speed of the prototype challenge car very quick through the corners, almost as quick, if not as quick, as Memo Rojas was. It took the straightaway to get that done. You talk about track temperature, I think Chris has an update. Well, Brian, early on this race, we talked about how cold it was. It's still a very cool day, and track temp at the beginning of the race was down in the high 60s. Well, it's up to about 80 degrees now. So on this uh, next little run here, these guys, these tires are gonna come up to temp a little bit quicker than they did when we dropped the green earlier today. We talk a lot about temperatures. It certainly takes a certain heat range to make the rubber gain grip. The other thing that it takes is pressure in the tires, Tommy. If you don't have the right pressure, sidewalls really flex around. Flex around, and that the, the tire or the radial is there's a spring rate that's tied to the air pressure, and so the the chassis balance, ride heights, everything is different until the tires are up to the optimal uh, pressure. And here we are on board with the 93, and this is right in the middle of that GT Le Mans battle. You got the driver championship is at stake here. You got the manufacturer championship. See the Porsche in front. The 91 Viper still out front with Goosens having made that stop right before the yellow. But uh, some of the onboard footage heading down the back straightaway last time, they, the, the Porsche almost uh, squeezed the Corvette off the outside. This is 
looking out the back of the number three Corvette to the 93 Viper. The thing that I like about the camera shot from the 93 Viper, yes, typically we can roll that strip across. We've got a problem with it, but this is what's going to be like the windscreen. They've got tear offs that they'll want to pull on pit, spots, pit stops. And the reason why is look at how dirty that lens is already. We're just an hour and 10 minutes into this event. It's going to give you an idea of what the windscreens on the car are going through and why those tear offs are so important. We saw some of the tear offs being taken off during that pit stop already the Ferrari. And I was very surprised about that. But as you can see, the traffic, they're still having to work around even on lap two of this. Ooh. A little touch there, a little PC action, little Hug and a kiss as you go through there, and uh, that's fast. You're doing a, a strong direction change there. A lot of dynamics going on. All settled down as we head back down through it's here. It's kind of non-PC to me. I don't know. I was going to yeah. say it was a much more aggressive hug and a kiss than I'd want. Uh, different relationships. <laughs> um, so as they head out, this is wonderful. All these guys driving together. What I love about PC, I was talking with some of the drivers yesterday. Remember, um, Tommy Dreesy, we just saw his Dracula car there. Great. He has always has the best liveries on his cars, but he was saying it's great the open air the the being able the visibility was just fantastic in these cars sean rahal in that orange prototype challenge card a lap or so down after the problems for eric lux i Go mentioned that action from on board and look at this scrum you have the the vet up next to the the 912 they're leaning on each other a little bit you've got a you've got a ferrari and a gt daytona ferrari in the mix that they're going to have to all negotiate their way around and the value of that uh, 30 square feet that's right there. Look at that, three wide. Want to put a dollar and, figure on it? And Bomberitos. <laughs> look at that, look at that, squeeze. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's a, some ex <laughs> expensive, uh, that's more expensive per square foot than Santa Monica real estate. Not the ones you own, though. Yeah, <laughs> not that one. Yeah, not that one. Once again, out the right back up. of the number three Corvette gets past the Porsche into turn one. Front engine, rear engine, mid engine. I just love GT LM racing, don't you? I mean, it's, it's such different answers to the same question, but with the same result within a fraction. You see the 42 prototype that had the problem with the turbo boost, now beginning to slice through several laps down. Alex Prundle had the fastest lap time by well over a half a second, almost three quarters of a second. When they had the problem, the car has plenty of speed. It's just been the mechanical issues that have set the 42 back. We'll see how quickly he works through GTLM traffic. That didn't take long. No. We talk about, sorry, sorry we, we talk about visibility. Just this camera angle right now. See, he's obviously sitting about six inches in front of where our camera is, maybe 10 inches. But that is the window he gets to see in. Right now we're in bright daylight in perfect conditions. When we go into dust tonight, we'll be coming back to that. Visibility is tight, especially off the wheel arches to the right and left. Jörg Bergmeister just in front of him, in front of Bergmeister in that light blue and turquoise colored Porsche. Now Wolf Hensler has taken over from Brian Sellers. Hensler running second, just where Sellers was earlier. So impressed with Team Falcon Tire this weekend. Up front in PC, Johnny Molum in the number 88. And there's a look at Tommy Dreesey and his Dracula entry. Let's take a look at this. Boom, 38 and 87. So, Get Dre his fangs out next, yeah. I guess. So Dreesey goes around. That's maybe Martin Plowman behind the wheel. Got to look back to timing and scoring to see. But, man, boys in uh, prototype challenge not always playing as nice as they possibly could. You Can talked you about a hug and a kiss earlier. That was right. David Ostella. That uh, uh, car that's uh, uh, several laps down, that's uh, not what you uh, like to see. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that you realize you've had the problems. You can't make them all up at one time. You've got to be a little more level-headed than that. It's not like Martin Plowman's uh, just uh, lollygagging around. We understand the incidents under review. Here it is again, Ostella in the red car from back behind. And it, it just wasn't gonna happen. No, it was a little bit opportunistic where, and you relied on the corporate, cooperation of the other party and why should he, he's between left apex and right and uh, that wasn't gonna happen. You're being charitable. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean that, that, was just, that was just brain dead. I mean, you, you're not even trying to make a move. You just, you just ran into the guy. GT Daytona, your leader there, Ben Keating, 
in the Viper in the number 33, Jan Halen in the 58, Townsend Bell all the way up in his Ferrari number 555, up to third. They started well back in the category. The, really, the balance of performance has not been in the favor of the Ferrari in GT Daytona. And I think they've played a little strategy and moved forward. They're trying to hold on to a driver's championship that they've fallen back from the lead on. But uh, the team, a Mo Autosport, should win the team championship in GT Daytona. But Bill Sweetler, Townsend Bell have been at it all year long since their victory at Daytona. And that I think they just slipped out of the lead of the driver's championship back at Coda. They want to be back there. They want this thing desperately. That's tough to lead the whole season no. and then uh, have it slip away very at the very end. But you know, long way to go, and uh, and they're, they're up in uh, in the top three right now. You ride on board the number 48 Audi of Christopher Haas from here at the 17th running of Petit Le Mans. It's Ricky Taylor who leads overall, and in the prototype category, more from Road Atlanta right after this. The 17th running of Petit Le Mans is underway, an event that has become a must on any driver or manufacturer's list of classic endurance contests. Ricky Taylor leads, though the competition has been fierce throughout the four classes that compete in the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. Championships for manufacturers, drivers, and teams still up for grabs, but the celebrations will have to wait for the checkered flag 10 hours later. Catch all the action live on Fox Sports 2 at 3 o'clock. After the problems for the Sky Active Mazda, the 07 in qualifying, now problems here in the race. One hour and 18 minutes in, and the 07 being pushed down pit lane and behind the wall. Don't know what the problem is right now, but anytime the car leaves pit lane, the work is going to be extensive, and that's not good news for that team. And look how busy it is on the racetrack, and a problem for the 49. Right where it had trouble this morning. Oh, no, that's turn one, exit of turn one. That was the car that was damaged in warm-up this morning in turn three. Same driver, Pierre Giuseppe Perazzini. And, you know, when you come over here and you race, they're running the endurance races in the Tequila Patron North America Endurance Cup. And you come over here, it's a new group of drivers you're not used to running with. We, we said this really kind of cuts both ways. If you're after a championship, Perazzini kind of bailing there at the top of the hill. If you're in the middle of a championship run and you got drivers like this coming in that don't normally run here, they can certainly affect your championship. This is down in turn one. Just doesn't know that the Flying Lizard Audi is on the inside. A pretty aggressive move by the Audi, but Perazzini gets the worst of it to the outside. He didn't have much further to go, but I have to say, it, it looked like the Audi went, yeah, there, I'm here, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to show and you. By the way, yeah. There was three little hip checks there, but he was on the outside, and he's going fast, and uh, but there wasn't much space on the outside for, for the Ferrari. But it certainly unsettled him, didn't it, Tommy? I'm not sure whether he's got a right rear tire problem there because he just kind of nonchalantly strolled across the grass. Well, there's a whole tr uh, train of uh, PC's cars coming through there. I think he just realized he just didn't want to get any more. This was on board the 07. We talked about the problems. Pretty desperate sound on the crew member there saying off of that throttle, obviously seeing something on telemetry that they didn't like, perhaps oil pressure or temperature. Chris, what do you know? Well, just what you said there, Brian, temperature. That uh, Mazda diesel really makes a ton of temperature, and that's something that they've been learning all year long, trying to keep that motor cool. Just checked in with that team, and they're still trying to diagnose that issue, but they've been just running hot, and they think they probably did a head gasket, so that's why they pushed that car back into the garage area. Well, a diesel power plant produces so much energy, and that small sky-active diesel, where all that energy 
kind of uh, comes to rest, so to speak, is in the temperature in the head of that engine. And it's the one thing that they might need to change developmentally in order to keep those high temp problems from happening in the future. But it looks like they've been bitten once again. Speaking of temperature, a few leaves uh, fall that have fallen off the trees on the front of that Action Express car. And Ricky Taylor's put his head down and has built himself a nice little gap. Again, you look at the fast lap of these two cars, they're they're on the same hundredth, 115.009, 115.004. So uh, peak speed is virtually identical, but Taylor maybe getting through traffic a little better or just uh, in a real groove. And don't forget this man, Oswaldo Negre, back a little bit behind them another three seconds 2.3 seconds behind Fittipaldi is Oswaldo Negre but so impressed with Mike Shank I said they did that testing at Mid-Ohio worked on the drivability of this Ford EcoBoost and it's paid big dividends but one more time Negre and John Pugh are going to have to do this by themselves and uh, that's hard work when I saw that I went to talk to Mike Shank and I said talk to me about the two driver rotation and he said not my decision. So it, wow. I, I gathered that he wasn't a huge fan of that. The drivers made the call. Here's the incident between the 45 and the 49. Ah, that's the, there's certainly not a car width left there on the exit. So uh, he's going to get a drive-through penalty. And race control, yeah, not pleased with Nelson Canace Jr. And I think you said it, Justin. It wasn't just one tap. It wasn't two. It was. <laughs> Three. Well, Good ones. Why not? <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm glad. Great call from race control. Yeah. It's uh, you've got to keep the discipline up. Um, but look, you see, do you know what? It's funny, isn't it? Not many people have had the privilege of walking down that little hill there. I'm just going to, to the braking area we saw there. The elevation change. That's here. not a little hill. <laughs> yeah, I was it's say. not a little hill. This isn't a little hill. And all the GT cars, everyone's flat through there now. The top cars. That's quite impressive. 49 just getting roughed up there and won after Canace pushed him to the outside. They had a problem in warm up. Perazzini in the car. This was up at the at the top of the hill in the braking zone for turn three. Oh. That was hard contact. Yeah, wet grass, not doing anything to slow the car down, and limping it back to the you know the warm up was at eight this morning, and so they had to get that car turned around quickly to make the start. And they barely they were coming out a lap or two late. It's, it's, it makes you cry to see that beautiful Ferrari crunched up like that. And work for the mechanics to do just in the last hour or so before the race so there's a there's always a pressure and just like your road car when you get a little ding in it you you think to yourself oh, oh god it's going to cost someone something it does cost someone something in racing too the, everything's expensive especially on a ferrari i do want to point out we we were told that the the 45 was being called in for a drive-through penalty there's been a change in the way they've been officiating it's one of the things i was most critical earlier in the year Every contact seemed to result in a stop and hold that cost a lap. And I actually sat in as one of the guest officials at Laguna Seca and A, learned that it's a lot harder than it looks. And, it, and, and you got, to, if they don't have pure, real, first-hand evidence, they don't do it based on reports from the corners, uh, they can't make the call. But I, I, that was one of my inputs is I said, you know, if it's just an incidental contact, both cars continue, I think the stop and hold's excessive. So they started administering a couple different categories of penalties. And I think that's the right call in that case. When well, you talk about contact, it was back at VIR, Virginia International Raceway, where Porsche and Corvette came together and Richard Leitz got the worst of it. He's down in the pit lane with Chris Neville. Well, that's right, Brian. Richard Leitz that day got the worst of that accident. He started off the year great at the Rolex 24, getting the win there in GTLM, but everything went bad at VIR that day. First of all, the left arm, that's what you broke there. How is the arm? Um, well, I had bad luck in Virginia. The elbow was broken uh, in like more pieces, but I was lucky that it came together at the right places, so there was no surgery, and it was just uh, fixed with a blast for now like four weeks. And uh, I can do physiotherapist since one week, and uh, it looks good that I can start next week in Fuji for the WEC championship, uh, for the next round of this championship. And unfortunately, it was not quick enough, uh, the healing for this race, but I'm happy to be back, to be back um, watching the race and getting ready for next week in Fuji. Yeah, that was a pretty scary day there, and it's good to see you're out of the cast, good to see you're gonna be back in the car, but are you back to 100% in that arm? Uh, I hope I, it's gonna be 100% in one week. Uh, so far, it's getting better every day. Um, and the training, the training helps a lot. You know, when you are fixed in the blast and you cannot do anything, all the muscles go down and you have really no, no power anymore. And now, uh, you know, we start to recover and uh, I think it will be okay for next week, but I would say it's like 70% now at the moment. Well, we'd love to see you back in the car, but good to see you at the racetrack this weekend.
That was a big hit. You saw on the replay there the Aston Martin losing fluid, and then the Porsche came through, Leeds came through. He spun off, and then the Corvette right behind him, Jan Magnussen, but was behind the wheel of the three. That was big. And now that's where you look at the attention that the Corvette guys have put into. They've got higher door bars. They've got energy absorbing foam for exactly that kind of impact. It'd be interesting to see if some of the other teams adopted. I understand. I talked to Doug Louth uh, at Pratt & Miller, and he said they spent a lot of time developing that energy absorbing. They've shared all their data with the FIA that's looking at maybe making that mandatory in the GT3 and the GT Le Mans cars. And of course, the problem wasn't the first hit. The problem was that he ended up the meat in the sandwich. He was up against the wall, then the Corvette came in. So so really the Porsche was the attenuator for the Corvette on the impact. Yeah, I just, as we're watching now, back to the screen, you've got, I mean, the Viper with with uh, Wolf Hensler right behind in the Falcon Porsche. It's, it's really great to see this because remember, everyone needs aspiration to go racing. Every sponsor needs enthusiasm and motivation and a goal. And I just think it shows that, as you said earlier, Brian, one car team decently funded by a tire manufacturer that believes in their product and goes racing here because they want to showcase to the performance car world that hey listen look at our cars as the second tire you you put on your road car we are good enough for it and when you look at this it's hard to hard to argue with as a ferrari goes a little wide there too another spirit of race ferrari with a problem up top wolf hensler yeah it's like you said I, i'm impressed with wolf i'm very impressed with what brian sellers has done in his development over the last several years he's always been a good race car driver, but I think as this team is built throughout the years, he and Wolf together, it is a team sport, and that chemistry is absolutely critical, and they certainly have it. But well, last year, that, that win was with the older 911s. Porsche did not agree to give them the the new uh, the new race chassis, and so between how this car runs and, to be quite frank, uh, the advice of the uh, the Falcon girls, I, I think uh, <laughs> highly of those tires. No, you, you are you are so right. It's amazing where we get our uh, information. What am but, I going to do with the two of you? Well, you probably get fired. Um, <laughs> what I'm thinking, though, just looking at this, you've got Goosens out in front in the 91. Bomarito in the 93 is seven mm. places behind. It's early days, but as the driver, as as you as your. Uh, one of the drivers in the championship, you must be thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, we should be like second, not seventh. A little emotions start to come in, little stress. Well, and, and if, if the Porsche can get around the Viper, that will change as they run. The manufactured championship is in Viper's hands at this instant. If one of the Porsches can get around the Viper, it goes, it goes to Porsche. So uh, they've got a bunch of things, moving pieces. Then they're also trying to hit at the four, eight, and 10 hour mark that uh, Patron Cup points as well. Driver, manufacturer, team, Patron Cup. I mean, there's so much on the line here. You ride on board the number three Corvette. The thing that I think is impressive is that the 17 Team Falcon Tire Porsche in front of the 911 of Jörg Bergmeister. And once again, if that team could bring home the manufacturer's championship for Porsche ahead of the factory program, that would be huge. Look at this, Bergmeister in that white 911 all over the back of Wolf Hensler in front as traffic begins to play. He's obviously listening to our broadcast because he's got his finger out now. Uh, he's really going to give a shot at this. Um, this is fantastic. This is fast, though, Tommy coming around here, isn't it? I mean, you're flat out in top gear and breaking downhill, very demanding on the car. Taking a look inside, not really making a move, but wants to show himself in that driver's side mirror of the Viper. And look at him, really good shot off of that 10A, 10B complex. GT Le Mans cars are flat out through this corner. Huge grip, huge lateral acceleration into the very fast turn one. And it's the same thing as the hill climbs, it catches the car and really picks up a lot of grip there. Impressed, it looks to me like Jörg Berkmeister doesn't have the car he wants through the faster corners. He lost some ground in turn 12 and up through turn one. And the Corvette now right behind the number three Corvette of Antonio Garcia beginning to close. And that is a gaggle of cars. The traffic is about to start causing opportunistic windows for everybody. As Look, you can see Bergmeister's got a little run out there. I love that corner, that left hand. You, you get it right, Tommy, in the car in front bubbles. You can get them down into here, but you've got to make it stick. And he's trying the outside run there. That's hard it, to make work. Well, unless it, now if that GTD car was on the other side, he probably could have made it work. But the, oh, he's, he's going to use cross. him as a pick. Oh, Use him as a pick. Bergmeister in the white 911 leaning on Hensler a little bit. At least bit. they're the same manufacturer. They're playing nice knot. 
<laughs> nice <laughs> comes the Most factory drivers, and here comes Garcia in the Corvette. Now the BMW right in front, that yellow BMW, that's a GT Daytona car. The so he doesn't quite have the pace. Oh, I must say that Bergmeister was slightly more gentlemanly than Hensler <laughs> was there, because he could have jammed him up behind the GTD car there at the same time. It yeah. is Coming down not the over. It is oh. not over. Hensler's on the curb on the inside. That is fantastic stuff. Bergmeister with a run in his white portion now down to turn one. I never got the memo this was a two hour race. This is fantastic. <laughs> It's not viewers, well, it's 10. Actually, it's showcasing what we've talked about. We're, we're so much talk about the championship, but with the exception of maybe the 94 GTD car, almost everybody's game plan to win the championship is they have to win their class or win the race virtually. So the, you know, the Vipers theoretically could finish second if the Corvette finished first, but it, it, A lot even of though they're racing for the championship, the answer to what they need to do in almost everyone's cases, we have to win. Antonio Garcia closing back in his Corvette. Back towards Jörg Bergmeister in the white Porsche. Meanwhile, the black prototype, Ricky Taylor, that is the overall leader who is slotted through. You run on board with Taylor right now. He too clears Bergmeister, and in front of him, Wolf Hensler, and then more GT Daytona traffic, GTD. There goes Taylor. Get an idea, that's probably the largest speed differential is between the prototype cars and then the GT cars, but we've seen how GTLM and GTD cars are very similar at the apex in the middle of the corners as are prototypes and prototype challenge cars. Now Bergmeister has to decide, do I go? Yes, he commits. And man, once you commit, that's the proper word. Yeah. So they're in their way through traffic very clearly. Remember, like I said at the beginning, top drivers are in the top cars, so it means slicing away through traffic is a bit easier. I've got to say though, there's there's always all season long for this fledgling championship. There's been it's been a, a summer of discontent for some people because the balance of performance, adjustment of performance is not always. Someone's going to be unhappy. But for the proof in the pudding, for the spectators watching right now, all I wish was that there was a BMW in this mix, and they really are suffering from the performance changes for this race. But other than that, we have the world's best manufacturers racing up against each other in close form. And uh, if I was running this championship, I'd say it's 90% of the job done, because uh, this is good entertainment. Yeah. The one that I, uh, well, we're going to get, oh, maybe I'll save myself from not wading into that, that mess, but uh, we're going to hear from Chris Neville. Well, Tommy, we heard Matt Yoakum say before the green came down that everybody in GTD on different agendas today. And for TRG, they were trying to take four consecutive pole positions and finally get a good result. Well, things not going their way. I just checked in with Kevin Buckler. That car running first at the beginning, running 14th now. And he said they're down on power. They've got telemetry issues, so they're not getting a good read on the car. So they're trying to figure out if they got a cylinder down, if they've got some type of electrical issue with that car. That's lots of question marks for a team that desperately needs a good result at the end of the season and it's going to be a tough long day for him well and kevin has worked so hard he and his wife deborah have worked so hard to bring this aston martin program to imsa both in the continental tire sports car challenge and in the tudor united sports car championship you see other gt daytona cars closing in on them and they've just had bad luck they have tremendous speed the cars are absolutely beautiful and well turned out they just need a little luck they're not getting it today Townsend Bell is coming fast, and they've been lapping about half a second quicker the last few laps. He's caught up, and Townsend sticking his nose in there, of course, setting himself up for a good run down the back straight while mindful of the GTLM car and PC car behind him. But uh, as we know, TK, Townsend, Townsend is a terrier when he gets the bit between <laughs> his teeth, and uh, I think he's got a, quite a swift move down there, or outside down the hill right now. Or when he gets in the same room with a sponsor. Well, uh, yeah, yeah you absolutely. Wanna, you wouldn't want to be in a lifeboat with one bottle of water because he'd have it. So you've got three different classes right there. The leading Ferrari in that group is a GT Daytona car. The Viper uh, right I'm behind okay. GTLM. And here's the spotters talking through and then that yellow prototype challenge car just gives you an idea how busy it is and the speed differentials and how it works out. Well, there's been a change at the front of GTD. At last, three. Uh, ben Keating was leading in the three. Viper yeah, with Jan Halen right behind him and Townsend Bell. Both Townsend, as we see, Tracy Krohn car turned around backwards, the 57 GT LM Ferrari. It's actually Nick Johnson behind the wheel right now. Nasty place to be. You oh. don't want to be there. Okay, he got that done, executed very well. He's going to have to hold back here, guys. He cannot join the traffic and interrupt their racing too much. 
but he will rejoin safely. Nick's, I mean, a world, yeah, world class a world driver, class ton, of a, ton of experience. I'm guessing we'll see contact. That's one of the major uh, funnels where... So this is, as they run, and, and, and purists hate this because they're going, well, this doesn't matter because the finish isn't for another eight and a half hours, but this is how it would play out right now. 3.01 for Sweetler and Bell, and Dane Cameron would just be two points back, but hey, we got a long way to go. Like I said, almost eight hours and 25 minutes before the end of it. So they just need to hold the position for another 825. I never got that criticism of as they run. When I was driving, I always wanted to figure because that affects your risk reward calculation, it, depending. Obviously, it gets more important as you get later. But if if you're in good shape, it, you know, you can be a little more patient when, as long as you know things are in your favor right now. If you're six points down, every position matters. Again, it gets more important as we get later. But I never understood why people said, I don't like this. Well, of course, the points aren't handed out until the end, but it's important to know where you sit. Marcus Paltala, if you rode on board with the 94 in GTD, he is well back in eighth, and now a problem for the 31, the Whelan Racing Corvette prototype. And what a great move there to just say, hey, I'm, I'm getting out of the way and letting him go by. It's Boris said, you talk about a world-class driver and a guy who's been around for a long time. Can he get it off the racetrack there at the Shut cut? That's off. turn five. Shut it off. Full course yellow, full course yellow. Third full course caution Everything of the day blue. flies. Perfectly positioned for the prototype next fuel window, almost. Think about that. Yep. It's two times 45 to me. That's up to about now. Well, and they, some of them might be in the position where they might have been heading that lap. So we'll have a really position where. Really yeah. interesting. So 90 minutes would be the 45 same. times two. So we know there's time off the clock in there for the pit stop. You know where I'm headed with this. That's the number five car. Question is, has Christian Fittipaldi been in the car now for 45 minutes? Does he have his share of the driver's championship? Is that a little rub? Was that a little rub? Is he past the 90 minutes Can he, or the 45 minutes? Can he be a little aggressive now in traffic? He is past the 45 minutes by my math. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm looking at it. I, I don't, I don't, don't think it was a seven-minute minute pit stop. stop. So in my mind, I think he's past it. It's time to go racing for Christian Fittipaldi and Joao Barbosa. It seems like Christian Fittipaldi now has his share of the 2014 Tudor United Sports Car Series Championship in the driver's category for prototypes. And wearing Fittipaldi on your... Uh, monogram shirt means that you're entitled to go fast, by the way. Let's check in on the 31 with Chris Neville. Well, Brian just spoke with the team. They said Boris had to stop the car and try and recycle the computer in that car. He was having a transmission issue. The car was not wanting to upshift or downshift. These cars, they shift by paddles on the back of the steering wheel up and down through the gears, but Boris was not able to do that. So that's why he stopped the car, turned everything off, shut the computers down, cycled back through. Now it sounds like the, now it sounds like they're working, so they might not come to pit lane. The team's still speaking with them, though. Computers. Well, and, and I, I <laughs> control all delete. If I'm not, yeah, when in doubt, reboot. Right? That's a, that's the only thing I know how to do. But. During my stint, you know, there was more than once. You know, when I was going for third, it just didn't go, and I'd have to hit it, you know, two or three times. See, it's like my wife. You can't hit keep hitting the enter key if nothing's happening. You get that wheel of death there on the computer. You heard him say, it didn't go, so I hit it several times. And this is something where I th I'm pretty sure the Action Express cars chose not to go to the paddle shift. I think they still have a sequential shifter in that car to avoid things. And they're one and two in the, both in the championship, one in the championship, one and two in the te uh, Tequila Patron Cup. Hey, let's check out some Honda news and notes from the weekend, the Tudor Banquet in New York City on October 13th. That is going to be quite the gala. You're not going to be there in a cocktail dress, are you, Justin? No, but I Thank will God. be co-hosting it with Bob Varsha, so you know that it'll be a mix of sweet and sour and <laughs> darkness and light. And I, do you know what's amazing to me? They had me back. So. Yeah, well, that is shocking. The other thing that's shocking is it's not long before we head back down to Daytona. The roar before the Rolex 24, January 9th through 11th in 2015. Not that far away. And look at the last one, Jochen Moss named as Grand Marshal for the Rolex 24. That's January 24th and 25th. Pretty impressive name there. And we've seen some great Grand Marshals in the past and we'll aim name Jochen Moss to that as well. 
I did the Conti banquet last night, but it was probably not nearly as colorful as you will be at in New York City. Well, my tie will be skinnier. I can already <laughs> tell you that. Uh, no, it's it's you know a real honor to be asked to, to to moderate and MC these things, and the New York one has a real big feel of. Uh, you, you, you get the feel of the NASCAR umbrella there, that we're, we're part of a very big family, and uh, a lot of the board members come. It's really quite in, quite special. Um, but Brian, you, Continental, you're a, you're there, man, and of course you moderated last night, and their race is going to be on TV any minute. Sunday, October 12th, 12 p.m. That's coverage of the race from here at Road Atlanta. Man, it, w it was, Conti was awesome this year. I mean, really, when you came to a Tudor weekend, you weren't going to be disappointed in any race that happened on the racetrack, where, whether it was Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge or the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. It's all been intense. On board the 62 from Risi Competizioni, it's Pierre Kaffer, who's now behind the wheel. Kaffer knows how to win here. He's won here in the past. I think he has two victories here. And remember that the manufacturer's championships were on the line. and. Couldn't be any closer. You thought drivers championships were close. You talked about it, Tommy. Tied in GTLM on the way in. And then in second place, which will end up being third and fourth, I guess, when it's all said and done, Chevrolet and BMW were tied. And you got to think that if it weren't for a little bit of bad luck that the Ferrari guys had at the beginning of the season, they would have been in there as well. I, I hate to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. Go but ahead. also, you know, you have that the incident at Sebring where the oh. wrong Porsche was penalized. Alex Job finished fourth. They think they would have finished better. They are trying to close the gap to win the championship. The Viper guys, of course, say, well, if that Porsche had been penalized, we'd be ahead. So there's all kinds of permutations depending. And I said these guys have memories like elephants. <laughs> Hopefully those will not be. They'll not gaps need will to not, call on those. Yeah, yeah. Those will not way in these championships back on board the 93 we talked about how we can't clean that lens off you can see the debris there it's just going to get worse and worse throughout the day prototypes now are on pit, lo pit lane the lane now open and here we go this race could easily be won or lost in pit not on the racetrack We see the 60 car running third for most of this race. As Waldo Negri got to do another stint behind oh the wheel. Boy, these guys are going to put a lot of hours in behind the wheel because it's just going to be Oz Negri, John Pugh, just going to do four Continental tires and fuel. Matt? And down in the leader, the 10, Wayne Taylor Racing. Driver change already got it. Ricky Taylor has climbed from the machine. Jordan's gotten in, so the car was good. A little bit of gravel, though, down at 10B on the racetrack. That's only really. He's Wait told the, the team that was a concern Wait for, for him. Remember, these guys came in. They're trying to hold on to second in the championship standings. Wow. When I first saw a it, I shemazel. thought they'd gotten together, yeah. but it was it was the red light at the end of pit lane until the field was passed. They they hold them there in pit lane, and as a driver, you're ready to go. They drop you. You're, you're off. Off, you take off from your pit box and you're like, go, 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 go time. And you get there to pit out and all of a sudden the light turns red and you got to stop now. <laughs> it's close. I'm so glad we weren't actually calling. We were letting Matt talk right then because we'd have gone down completely the wrong road. I thought they just hit each other, but that uh, that's great. So Jordan's now in the car. Uh, when you go out and you get your turn to get in the car, remember the car is very hot. You have, you're, no, you're not actually as the second driver in the race yet, you don't feel. You know, the, the temperature in the co cockpit is, is way hotter than you, you, you expect to when you get in. There's the smells, the noise, and you're going out on fresh tires, but you're behind the pace car. So you have this false adrenaline start because you're standing on the wall, on the stand, as they call it at Le Mans, and, and then you get in, you've got to back down. So I actually found this always harder than going straight out onto the track and, and, and hitting the, the go button. Uh, unless it was wet yeah. it gave you a chance to look I, for the puddles. I, I thought the opposite because you know you, you don't necessarily have the belts all the way done exactly they're done but they're maybe not as tight so you settle in it gives you a chance to really get comfortable get get kind of body warmed up a little bit before you're really at it in anger i think it was more your genetic flaws that, that <laughs> meant that was tougher because your teammates normally came to your belly button so therefore, there was some adjustment to, to, to be done when you got in the car. Yes. Although I, I drove with 
Pedro Lamy, so in, in the Viper, so I, I know what you're jumping at this morning. But you're right, there, there's a lot, and, and actually getting settled, there's nothing for a driver worse than having the, the water pipe not in or, or something. So I guess uh, both situations are okay. Scott Pruitt now behind the wheel of the 01 for Ganassi being shown back in 11th. That I'm sure will change. Scott not only just absolutely passionate about his racing, he's got a couple of other passions at home that he spends a lot of time with. Five-time Rolex 24 winner Scott Pruitt certainly measures up the best in the world on the track. But this sports car legend is still a kid at heart. I love cars. I've always loved cars. I mean, I started with Hot Wheels. And I, you know, had 10 of them, and then I had 20 of them, and then I had 100 of them, you know, different ones. And now, you know, as we move through the years and financial status, and now you can have some of those toys you've always wanted. And so I have a number of those toys, but I'm a classic car guy. I have a, a full custom 50 Buick Woody. I got a 67 VW bus that the family absolutely loves. Uh, 1960, yeah, the year I was born, Caddy convertible. Uh, a 55 Chevy Pro Street pickup that I built with my dad. At 53, Scott is starting to feel the burden of his years behind the wheel. Your body does take its toll just naturally going racing. And then all the stuff we do on top of it with crashes and accidents, with the latest surgery on my left ankle. You know, from my crash in 1990, it was just junk. The pain got worse and worse and worse and worse, and I had to get something done. I love racing, there's nothing like it. And to do it right, from my point of view, I gotta do everything I can as a driver. I train hard, I, I have you know, a workout facility at two, actually two different places here at the house. Being outside in, in, the, in the summertime, working out in the vineyards. So we got to put up this big fence all the way around it because we got a lot of deer. And then the bear, they'll just come in when they want. They just rip the thing down, come right through. The passion of going racing. I love this stuff. I absolutely, passionately love to do it. And I love kicking the out of these little kids. <laughs> a great champion and narrated by a great champion. It was Dario Franchitti, obviously, that was narrating that piece. But you look at it. Three Tudor wins this year, 41 Grand Am wins, 15 in IMSA GT, and the championships and the history, pretty impressive. But he's never won Petit Le Mans overall. Well, that's, I, I was shocked to hear those words come out. The, the writer of children's books loves to <laughs> kick the bleep out of these little kids. Yeah, he, you know, if, if you were going to sum up what a sports car driver's competitive drive was like. I think Scott Pruitt would really have it. I mean, a lot of these young guys out there now, they, you know, a lot of the young generation are coming out, uh, you know, pencil thin with, with you know, corporate doctrine. And, and for me, a racing driver also has to remember there, it's a manly, manly sport. And uh, Catherine Lake, manly women's sport. Um, I didn't mean that either. But you know where I was heading. You, you've got to Keep be strong. Digging. And really, I'm just going to bail on this one. But Scott is a proper man, a strong man. A, a courageous one, and if I was a young driver, I would look up to him and say, that is a career. If I could even get a tenth of that career, wow. I'd have made it. Well, you know, and, and what you should, if you want to study one guy's approach, he, he is, the, I mean, he runs, a, he has a complete book technically of every race he's ever run. He does, and then, uh, you know, he's just a consummate professional. Re I didn't always like racing against him because he was uh, he was also uh, pretty vicious with the, with the carve and the block, and then you go up to him afterwards and he's like, he looks at you like, what are you talking about? And so he's, uh, I mean, he's just hard, hardcore. Seeing the property there, that, that's, uh, I've, he showed me pictures of that property. Yeah, I've never seen it It's like overlooking that the American River, his vineyard, built the house himself. And uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you wonder why he always says hello to his family at home. They never want to leave that place. And I, why would you? <laughs> just send money, Dad, send money. I'll tell you what, I mean, I admire him, but he frustrates me greatly. He is a day older than I am. So he was born one day before I am, and I look at him, and I look at his drive, and I look at his, the physical condition that he's in, and all the things that he's done, and then yeah, I go I'm, back to the room, and I look at myself in the mirror and go, really? Yeah, I've seen the way <laughs> he looks really at you, let you, you really <laughs> let yourself go. <laughs> uh, no, Brian, it's like, it's like someone said to me, you know, you, your dad's in great shape. You'll never be as great shape as I said. I'm not in great shape as he is now. Be going green this time. Jordan Taylor leads the field. Christian Fittipaldi in second. And Fittipaldi now with the championship cemented. He shares that with Joao Barbosa after his 45-minute drive time. 
it's time to go. They're thinking about the Patron Cup. It's time to go racing. But for the Taylors, think about this. They know the championship's now over. If there's anything that they want now, if they can't have the championship, they want to go out of the season on a high note with a win here at Petit Le Mans. More problems in the pits. Here we go. Everybody lines up. Traffic light. <laughs> and look at the Corvette guys getting it done when they have to. The three Corvette did not come in first, but leaves first. Pretty impressive. You see the number 17 in there as well. What's going on in there, Camp Chris? Well, Brian, before that caution came out, we saw that car right at the front. I think it was in second place, and we saw some great battles going on there. Wolf Hensel behind the wheel. During that pit stop, he brought the car in, and it looked like Marco Holzer was going to get behind the wheel, but they decided to do a third stint with Hensler. The team was very quick on the stop, however, slow on the right rear. So that car stayed up in the air a lot longer than other GT cars, and I think they lost about three or four spots down here in pit lane. Well, that's the problem, you know, if you're pitting under green, and we are back to green, if you're pitting under green, the field's a little bit more spread out. If you make a mistake, you may not see it, but when everybody comes in together, if you falter, you're going to drop considerably. Taylor has worked his way through, but right behind him, Christian Fittipaldi is going to be charging hard. You and see, this is a real-time start. For this is almost the perfect execution of a full course yellow with those pit stops. So everyone is in their natural position on track. And that was beautiful carving through the traffic there. I believe they're behind Townsend right now, aren't they? Your overall leader is not the leader on the racetrack. That's the GT Daytona leader. And Taylor makes quick work of him with four different classes of cars. It's not always the overall leader that's in the in the front of the line at the at The way the, the rules are written, they do the wave around so that no classes are disadvantaged by the, the overall leading, leader being in between them. Then they do the pit stops. And then afterwards, they pick up the first class leader. In this case, because Townsend Bell and Ben Keating stayed out, the GT Daytona cars were at the front. So they pick up the, the class leading GTD car, and then everybody else is behind them, and then they go, go racing. Action Express entries run second and third that will be big for Patron Cup points it's Brian Frizzell in third in the number nine from Action Express his teammate just in front Jordan Taylor slicing around the number 57 Crone Racing Ferrari Nick Janssen after his problems back on track and underway but you can see that speed differential once again there at turn 12 I'll tell you the guys at Wayne Taylor Racing seem to have a good setup on the car they weren't as quick in qualifying as the number five, but they seem to have great race space. When I watch them drive, Tommy, I, it, for me, they look like two guys that are very in sync with that car. Their comfort level is very high. So from the minute they go out, we've seen it time and time again this year, they can they can charge when, as soon as that green flag goes or, or the track goes green again, they're very quick off, off the restarts. And Jordan Taylor breaking through and winning the championship last year. Of course, this year now, the new newly crowned champion, Fittipaldi and Barbosa. So you've got the basically the creme de la creme of this class, the teams that are most familiar with the package. Obviously the package has changed quite a bit to this year, but those teams are, you know, not a lot of continuity and uh, and just really in sync. And uh, you don't have to think before the car basically does what you want it to do virtually. Scott Pruitt up to fourth. He was back in 10th, not 10th in class, but 10th on the racetrack on the restart. And he has moved forward now fourth in class. And that's gonna happen on these restarts. You'll get past the slower cars in front of you, move forward. Overall, fourth now on the track, fourth in class. It's Jordan Taylor, then Christian Fittipaldi, then Brian Frizzell, then Scott Pruitt, then Gabby Chavez in the zero, the Delta Wing. Delta Wing still in the top five. You called that pit stop, the exit, Tommy, really well. The Corvette was extraordinary, the Pratt & Miller pit stop there. And it's paid off because track position. I don't think they got the fastest car because the Porsche, the 911, is right behind him. But uh, yeah, the 911 is right behind him. But he, he, they certainly were amazing coming out of the pits. And there were not, there were no driver changes, I don't think. On board the 62, trying to work their way around. It's Pierre Capper trying to get past the 33, the Dodge Viper, which is the GT Daytona entry. Ben Keating piloting that white Viper. Right behind Keating now, there's the 33. Right behind him, the number eight, the prototype challenge entry. So it's that class on class fight you're trying to get through ringer van de zanda in the number eight for star works trying to get through he wants to move that car forward they've had some good races this year a victory actually two road america and at mazda raceway laguna seca 
just a little bit further down the order than they wanted to be. They didn't have the qualifying that they wanted here, but Van de Zanden now moving the eight forward. He's got to get around some of that GT Daytona traffic. Now the number four Corvette lined up behind Ben Keating. Especially in the braking zones. You talked about the aerodynamics, the brakes, maybe a little bigger tire, and it just it makes that little bit of difference. And you see it in places like braking zones and high-speed corners. And where, where it's uh, some of the cars, uh, when I was talking to Andy Lally, uh, because the GTD cars are so quick on the top end, if you don't stay right with them to the brake zone, you're coming from a little ways back, it can be frustrating and lead to some desperate lunges. Anytime I do a lunge, it's desperate, but that's another thing altogether. That goes back to my physical conditioning compared to Scott's, right? Down through the S's, you see the Viper now being chased, that beautiful red and white Viper being chased by the 912 Porsche. Earl Bamber now behind the wheel of the 912. There's on board the 911, York Bergmeister. And Antonio Garcia has just been magic in this three car all year. Really, really tough to beat. Um, they, they had a, frankly, a lackluster race at Coda and uh, not quite sure what that was about. I mean, you, if you just, you sneeze, you you're, you're go from first to eighth, but a uh, big swing in the points, but the three car has really been strong this year and just had a bad run at Coda. So they need to try to uh, re reverse that and, and pull back those seven points. Talk about reversing it. As you said, the Corvette so strong at the beginning of the year, the Viper seems to have come on at the end of the year. Corvette had gotten some balance of performance or adjustment of performance changes along the way and then kind of got some of it back, but it's like they haven't been able to go back to where they were. It's like they got rid of the playbook as they moved down the line. I understand the problem on the Flying Lizard Audi, the number 35, you see it to the right of your screen, the silver, and red Audi with the blue accents on it. I'm hearing one of the doors might be not latched. Let's see, down through turn 12. It looks like he got it latched. He must have done, or the aerodynamics are probably playing a or, little or, yeah. play, pinning that door to the side, but. Wait until he breaks into turn seven where it's nice and slow and see if it comes open again. So far, so good on the 35. Perhaps they've gotten that problem taken care of. It's just a little extra cooling. Dion Von Molka behind the wheel. And this is the car, actually, I think it's the only make in GT Daytona that has not won. Actually, Might have figured out why the door looks like it's closed is because uh, we're being told it's the 45 Audi that's reported. 35, 45. They're close. They're painted the same. There's the 45. Let's see if we can find the problem here. This will be heavy braking down into turn 10, 10A. Spencer Pompelli behind the wheel now, the 45. There you see the door popping open. It's not the place to reach out and hold on to it either. Neither is turn 12. Can only go so far with that arrow, right? Oh, and he used every inch of road. It's got to be a little disconcerting as a driver. You know, the arrow will hold it back a little bit, but at the same point in time, it's opening there. You're feeling that little extra breeze and a little bit of peripheral vision change. Well, and it, when you're any little thing, give me the drink hose wobbling a little bit. Yeah. It, it takes your, it distracts you. And some people don't, any little thing that's out of place for me drives me nuts. And so now Spencer Papelli probably has as many laps around Road Atlanta as perhaps any driver in this race. So he could probably do it, uh, you know, almost one handed, but. Uh, but he wants a left hander. I mean, <laughs> he doesn't want a right hander to do it. And he's got one of those at the end of the straight there coming down the hill. It's not, a, not many places that you're going to be able to do close that door. And don't forget, he has a safety net. Yeah. He has the roll cage and he has to get his right hand underneath because he certainly can't use his left. Well, I, I'm guessing he's not going to be able to. You saw that actually on yeah. that close up shot. You can see there really is no gap, which is the idea. The, the nets are to keep the arms in the car. If you can reach your arm through it, it kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. It's being shown an eighth in class right now. The other problem is that side view mirror is on that door. So every time the door moves, it basically negates his ability to use that side view mirror to just kind of look down and check. 
We talked about the problems on several of the race cars. It was a 42 that had a problem a little bit earlier when Alex Brundle was behind the wheel. He's now in the pit lane with Matt Yoakum. And that 42 team is currently ninth in class. And Alex, it certainly has been a weekend full of challenges for you and the team. Yeah, we've had a lot of difficulties uh, with uh, motor stuff. I mean, that, that just then was a, was a turbo issue, unfortunately. But uh, we're making our way back through the field. And uh, only one lap down now, and my focus obviously the, the Patron Endurance Cup because I'm not running the whole uh, TUSCC this year. So um, we're looking at being there, you know, all race long to try and pick up those points. Um, but yeah, we, we can get it back on the lead lap and we'll, we'll be at the front. All right, good luck. Chris? Well, Matt, I was just taking a walk through the garage and I found Ricky Taylor sitting out behind his hauler. And Ricky, you and your brother won way back in May at Detroit, so it's been a bit of a drought. But this is also your first time at Petit Le Mans. Lots of pop and circumstance, and you had a great first run there. How's the 10 car running? Yeah, we've got a great car. I mean, uh, the lead kind of came to us a little bit in traffic, but uh, we're really looking for a little redemption after, you know, how many months is that since May of, you know, being out of victory lane and off the podium for so many. So. You know, we're going to keep pushing hard. We've got a championship to protect in second place. But, uh, you know, we're going to keep pushing hard. We want to win. After Dad won the first one in 98, we got to we got to prove him that he's not, uh, you know, God over here. <laughs> well, I was trying to figure out why Ricky was sitting out back behind the hauler. And then as I walked up, I realized they got the big green egg fired up back here. And it smells great. Ricky, what, what are you guys doing for lunch here? Uh, we, we had to import an Alabaman because we're cooking out uh, some chicken wings here on the big green egg. Um, or, I shouldn't be holding the tongs, the, uh, the southern guys should, but uh, they're looking great, they smell great. Uh, I might have to pop in a couple of these before my next stint. Yeah, I think you gotta do because we got a 10 hour race here and I think I'm gonna stick around for a couple of these guys too. Brian? I wanna go down there. Oh, and a problem on the racetrack. One of the prototype challenge cars with a spin up at the exit of three, the entry to four. It's the number 88, one of the bar one entries. Back under way. LED. It was running in fifth at the time. I don't know how much time he lost. The 54 now right behind, trying to work his way through. The question is, why was the spin? Was there contact or was it a driver error? A little frustration on behalf of the 54 there because he's like, okay, you just rejoined. Get up to speed, weren't you? But uh, discretion, the better part of valor there is when you're in a sports car driver, in the team briefing, they say go as fast as you can, but if you have to drop a second or two seconds on track, it's okay because we can regain it. We can't regain it if you go in the gravel trap. That's harder to come by. So how's Spencer doing with that door, Tommy? Has he fixed it? No, he hasn't. I think he's using it as a movable aerodynamic device, Tommy. <laughs> it's like a fish gill. <laughs> if he was leading, his competitors would be on the video <laughs> you know hauler, and I exactly guarantee you. That. Now, to, to point out the heads up driving by Colin Brown there, that Colin Brown was, is leading PC right now. And so he probably gave up three, three or four seconds on that lap with that 88 kind of getting his wits back about him. But that's why they've swept all the endurance races this year. It's heads up driving like that. You're leading, you're, you're keyed up, you want to build your gap. And sometimes you give four or five seconds of the back at once, and it kills you to do that because you earn it three or four tenths at a time. But that's uh, that's just what you have to do. You just got to just manage your emotions and uh, keep it in check. And it's hard to say I'll give up four seconds now, but if you don't, the risk could be four minutes in pit lane oh. to repair the damage. On board the number three Corvette, Antonio Garcia, now being shown first in GT Le Mans, then Bergmeister, Kaffer, Goosens, and Bamber. So it's Corvette, Porsche, Ferrari, and then Viper. And Corvette's where they need to be right now. And Garcia needs to be up front. He needs to be in front of, of the 91 and the 93, because remember that driver split. Bob Marito stays in the 93. And Kuno Wittmer to the 91, trying to make sure that they've got every opportunity to win the championship. Garcia trying to do the same. I need to double check the gap, but I uh, I believe to ensure is the Viper needs to be on the podium if Corvette wins. So right now he's one spot off podium. Of course, seven and hours and 55 minutes to go. But, uh, you know, every position changed will uh, has consequence. Garcia is one of those chaps. If you sat next to him on a plane and he told you he was a champion race driver, you'd be like, yeah, I'm sure you won on PlayStation. Because he's so, do, do, so quiet, gentlemanly. He gives you a little smile and then goes, puts his helmet on and 
becomes a little monster. So you uh, saw a little bit of that when he was uh, he was hip check trying to hip check the uh, Falcon car over so he can get when he was trapped behind that GTD car. On board with Pierre Caffer, the climb up to turns two and three here at Road Atlanta. It's substantial, then heavy braking at the top, and then a tight section. The Mueller GTD Porsche in front of this battle, so they'll have to get around him. Great that example of how you cannot. Let the, the traffic in front, you have, like you just said, you have to evaluate. Meanwhile, the guy behind can be a little more cavalier in his, in his a aggression. You just saw that the Falcon Porsche there was about to take a lot of advantage over the 911 when he, when he backed off for traffic. But, and this is, this is pretty hefty pace here by the, by the GTLM guys. They are, they are all racing every second because you never know what's going to happen now if there's another yellow or track position. That, they really have to stay on top of their game. Now, everyone, this, to talk about how close in pace, Antonio Garcia's fastest lap, 19.008. Kaffer, 19.003. Hensler, 19.022. Bomarito, 19.057. That's four or five of the contenders on the same tenth of a second. The quick lap right now in is, uh, is Goosen's at an 18.774. Down the hill, the number 17. Wolf Hensler being shown in six, that blue and turquoise Porsche. And just right in front of him, Hensler trying to make ground on Earl Bamber in the factory Porsche, that white 912 just in front. But great battles all throughout. You saw the red Ferrari of Pierre Kaffer earlier battling with the 911, the team car to Bamber. And it has just been intense since the drop of the green. We've talked about it earlier, and you can't say it enough. Driver, manufacturer, and team championships all on the line. And when you hear a name like Earl Bamber that we haven't heard a lot, uh, the confidence that Porsche must have in this young driver to put him in one of their factory cars when they are battling for the GTLM Manufacturers Championship speaks volumes of what they think about that young driver. It's looking out the back of York Bergmeister's 911 Porsche. It's Pierre Kaffer in the red Ferrari trying to put the move on him, and I think that Ferrari, maybe they got the pressures a little better on the stop. Chris talked about it earlier, that first set, they felt like their air pressures were off. They didn't have them set where they needed to be, but the Ferrari really seems to have come alive a little bit. And Kaffer able to put pressure significantly on Jörg Bergmeister. I mean, if you're in a medium mi midfield PC car, you're getting violated oh. by these GT cars right now. That as is on close, cue. as if on cue. They are just, look at that poor little guy in the middle there. He is getting Vipers, Ferrari, Porsches, Corvette. That is a sandwich. Do we pick up the uh, second place, well, not second place, but the 93 Viper is running back there right now in uh, seventh place in class. Now, Tommy, his out the window perspective is, is also with a different emotion too, isn't it? He's, they've been in that position pretty much the whole race. Uh, it's not for lack of pace, it's just the field is so tight. And this is one of these things where it, it's weird to think of track position being important in an endurance race, but we, a couple of them got out of sequence on that stop. That's how the 91 Viper got up front. Uh, that's how the, the three Corvette got up front, was on either strategy or on pit stops. And uh, you see now, obviously they're not taking as many chances as they will near the end, but last year, no one could get around that Falcon car when it came out in front on the last pit stop. And in seven hours, that track position is going to be very important inside the Viper pit. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, right now you can have a little bit more of a balanced approach to it, but the Vipers look really, the difference between watching you around here last year, your car in its development year to its execution year, yeah. the, the car now looks so good. That's on, what Kuno said to me when I saw him on the grid. He says the car is so good now. Really? On board with Marcus Paltala in the number 94, the BMW from Turner Motorsports. This is how GT Daytona stacks up as they run. Townsend Bell has done a spectacular job to take the 555 Ferrari to the front for AIM Autosport, and they would win the GT Daytona championship if it were to end like this. We keep saying if is still a long way to go, just over two hours into this 10 hour contest. But right now, it seems like they've found a little handle since qualifying.
Well, but and some strategy. Some strategy, but also, so Townsend obviously is the gold driver in the Ferrari. The gold driver in the BMW, of course, is Dane Cameron. So Cameron has not been in yet. So it's going to be a little bit of an ebb and flow. I suspect when it, all the chips are down at the end, they're going to line it up so that those all the gold drivers are in, with the exception, uh, like I said earlier, of Mario Farnbacher. He seems to be the bullet for that 23 car. Well, and let me ask you this. I mean, Conrad Grunenwald is the third driver in the 555. Here's a guy who's done some sports car racing, very good drift driver. You don't think him of him as an endurance specialist. In fact, I, I don't think I, he's on anybody's list as an endurance specialist, but he's been drafted in as the third driver in that 555 Ferrari. That's a bit of a roll of the dice, isn't it? I'm not taking anything away from his ability, but this is a different playing field. Well, he, he's certainly not a specialist because he hasn't done a lot of it. Whether right. he's good or not, we're about to find out. Everybody at some point in their career, in business or in sport, is given a little helping yep. hand by someone else and an opportunity. Yep. Everyone in this room has had it, it's what you even make to it. sit here. So, you know what, I, I, I follow Conrad in the drifting thing. I, I, know, I, I know the group around him, a lot of faith and belief in him. I was very surprised, but who are we to knock a shot when, when the kids, if he just, at the end of this race, we'll either be saying he's a hero or we won't. Yeah. Where we what should a, cue the Eminem, the, the one shot uh, yeah. song, right? It's certainly, certainly not doubting his ability. It's just unknown right now. And I think when you come into a weekend with everything on the line, like AIM Autosport has it, I just found it a bit of an odd time to give somebody an opportunity. There's the 55 BMW from Team RLL. For more on that team, let's check in with Matt. And catching up with Joey Hand. And Joey, at this part of the race, where do you feel you guys are as far as handling? Uh, please, at this juncture. Oh, I mean, the guys. Guys feel pretty good with this Crown Plaza Z4. I think uh, I haven't been in the car since night practice, so I'm just listening to what's going on. But yeah, you know, right now we're just trying to stay clean. We can do some balance adjustments during pit stops um, and make the car better. You know, the, the key for this thing's gonna be when the night falls, those last couple hours, make sure we got a good race car that's clean and then you can go fight. But I think right now we don't have the outright speed. So we're gonna have to do it on smarts and strategy. You know, many expecting the track, and it takes more rubber to change a little bit, and you were in the car at the night time, so what trends did you pick up last night? Well, I mean, always in the night, you gotta figure out your, your points, you know, you can't see a lot. So you gotta figure out where the racetrack's going. But the night is, uh, it's kinda cool because the, the racetrack's taking rubber all day long. When that rubber cools down, uh, different than what you think, it actually makes more and more grip, and so, if uh, if your guy has got good eyes and you're, and you're comfortable with the night, you can actually probably run your best lap times in the night. So the track gets pretty quick. You want to make sure the car's uh, got good front grip in the night so you can put it where you want and, you know, then uh, make sure your headlights are working and go racing. All right, team looking good so far. Stout in the 10th position, Brian. Yeah, you know, you talk about strategy and you think, well, driving a race car is all about going fast, but the guys in the pit lane and those guys that are much smarter than I that actually were studying when they were in school instead of messing around like I was, the smart guys, they can figure out ways to move you forward. And that strategy, that was having that right guy on the pit box is critical. Yeah, and something I want to comment on something that uh, Joey Hand said there at the end. Um, it's, it's, it's a big if, but because there isn't the, the kind of a, uh, auxiliary lighting here at Road Atlanta like there is at Daytona, um, it's not a foregone conclusion that, that everyone can see. But if the driver is comfortable and can see well at night, you can go as quick. So uh, some guys might, uh, yeah, I've noticed, to be quite frank, as I've gotten older, when I was young, I was like, what are these guys talking about? It's, Driving at night's the same as driving in the daytime. As I got older, the, for some reason, uh, the eye uh, sharpness goes away. And uh, I had one engineer, he said, every driver pairing I've ever had, the fastest guy was always the youngest guy. I'm not young anymore, so. At I, night, at night. Yeah, there you go. Out in front, Jordan Taylor still leading over Christian Fittipaldi, and there's Jordan Taylor. Now, we talk about some of the problems that happened at Coda in contact with the 42. This was at the start, up into turn one. Gustavo Jakobin into the back of the 10 from on board, 0-1. Now, when I, I was watching that one at home, and when I saw that, I, I was, it went, Ricky Taylor pulled over kind of in front. He was trying to, I think, head off the 0-1 car, but pulled in front of Jakobin, whether, I mean, I think that was mostly Jakobin's fault. 
No but love loss. Bullet, standing in front of a, a, a raging bull and, and <laughs> pointing your finger saying he was, why'd he do that? That's what Yakuman and does. Just in case you think he shrunk, that is a Yakuman pinata, which was hanging up <laughs> in uh, the, the Wayne Taylor's uh, truck. That was very funny. Uh, in fact, their press person told me, and I said to them, oh, have you gone and told um, Gustavo that he's that hanging up? Because, yeah. A yak pinata. A yak pinata. Well done. It, soon to be in Toys R Us. Coming to a store near you right now. Jordan Taylor out in front. Impressive lap times. You talked about it, Tommy, but still the best lap time. Christian Fittipaldi has been about a tenth quicker out there. The differential right at three seconds. It ebbs and flows based upon the traffic that they come across. But it's and all about pride at this point in time. Pride, but also, you know. Uh, Patron Cup as well. Patron Cup, but. When you're at this level in this kind of racing, at the end of a season, you know your car, you know your competitors. What you actually, there's only one speed to go, and that is fast. There is no way to balance it out more than that. When you start slowing up, you start making mistakes and then tempt fate, so. This is during the piece we just looked at. This is what was going on on the racetrack. Gives you an idea of what these guys are having to deal with and the level of concentration. So. Looking on the outside of a, a GT Daytona car, now they got a PC car that's navigating its way around. A GT Daytona car, PC car looks outside, can't. You see Jordan actually laid back so that he could go through turn 12 at full speed. That's one of the things you do. You, you want to catch him in the right place. Having a little bit of a gap over Christian allows him to do things like that. If he's right up your tailpipe, you can't do that sort of accordion effect and, and pick your spots as well. The idea of getting a clean lap here, well, it doesn't exist in race conditions. When you think about it, just over 30 cars started the race last year, 52 started this year, and it gives you an idea of just how busy it is on the racetrack. It's busy right now for Jordan Taylor, but can they end the season on a high note as he splits traffic down the back straightaway? There, a look at your four class leaders from Petit Le Mans, the 17th running of this great event. The 17th running of the Endurance Classic, Petit Le Mans is underway at Road Atlanta. And while Jordan Taylor leads, the competition has been intense throughout the four different classes of cars. They compete for their own season long championship in the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. A race win here is something that every team driver and manufacturer wants to put on their list of accomplishments. But to reach victory lane, they'll have to allow and endure for 10 hours of competition on this racetrack. Join Petit Le Mans live on Fox Sports 2 at three o'clock. Full course caution out again at Road Atlanta. The 17th running of Petit Le Mans. Looks like an Audi off, perhaps down in turn one. We'll have to check back and make sure which corner that is. But you see the flag station, the main flag station at the start finish line and the double yellow flag, the sign that says safety car and the white flags that you see signify a slow moving vehicle on the racetrack. It was the 45 Audi, the flying lizard Audi from Flying Lizard Motorsports. The problem down there, Spencer Pompelli behind the wheel. Pompelli been fighting with that open driver's door. It's still open. Still open. I think it was a DP. I really don't know because I, I checked and it was clear. I didn't see anything on the radar. I was by myself, but I was out the apex when I got hit. So it might have been the Porsche. I don't know. You heard him say, I checked. I didn't see anything on the radar. They run a system similar to that of Corvette. It shows traffic behind you and gives you arrows. Tells you when that traffic's problem or, or is, is coming and could be a problem. There is a problem. Looks like the 87 or the 88. The 87, Mark Drumright behind the wheel down in 10A at the chicane. So while Pompelli was having his problem over in one, Mark Drumright, the problem down in 10A, breaking for the chicane. But unless I'm mistaken, I think Spencer's closed the door. At one point, it looked like it was hanging off the hinges when he came off the grass, which is not surprising. Right. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of energy going through those hinges. 
but it looked like he actually closed the door. On the, la on the faster car? On the car. faster car. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no, you could see him reach out. It was off the hinge, and he reached it. Finally, going slow enough, reached out and pulled it up. Chris Neville, you got something for us? Yes, I do, Tommy. Max Pappas going to be getting behind the wheel of 31 here soon. And, Max, we know there were some problems earlier. Everything okay with the car now? First of all, you know, it's great to be back in the Tudor Series. You know, I love it. And uh, our wheel and car, you know, we actually developed it, you know, got a little bit better. We had a gearbox issue. We had the same problem in practice. Um, actually, a little bit different. You know, we, we had a, a gearbox malfunction. And uh, that stopped uh, the signal back to the uh, ECU, so we had no shift. And uh, I definitely feel that maybe going uh, with the manual stuff, it would have not been a bad idea. You know, a little bit different role for you this year, part-time kind of in your driving, but doing a lot of time coaching Austin and Ty Dillon in NASCAR. What's that like? Yeah, first of all, let me say hi to the fans out there and to the people, all the people that wish me happy birthday yesterday. And if Austin and Ty are listening, you know, good luck today in the race and tomorrow. As you said, you know, obviously, you know, transitioning a little bit from a uh, full-time drive uh, into, uh, you know, advisor for Oster and Ty Dillon. You know, those two guys, uh, they have a great future, great talent, and I'm really proud of being able to be part of uh, Richard Childress Racing as an uh, uh, integral part of their organization. You know, I test for them, and I coach Austin and Ty all the time, and uh, hopefully, you know, my job is making sure that in a few years' time, they will not need me anymore. Yeah, as you were coming up through open wheel ranks, did you have anybody helping you like that? Absolutely. Like, you know, when uh, you always need a mentor, you always need someone you can lean on. And uh, through my career, you know, the two people that really they were the most uh, helpful for me was uh, obviously Ayrton Senna. When I was a young kid, he was my mentor, my best friend and, uh, you know, like a big brother. And uh, when he passed away, I joined Chemcar and uh, the person I always went to was uh, Mr. Rick Mears. You know, great help for me, super person. and. Uh, taught me a lot of things about life and a lot of things about how to drive these cars and uh, I'm applying it all and trying to give it back to the sport uh, to, uh, to Austin and Ty at this moment. Well, Max Pappas in a little bit different phase in his career, but hopefully we see a little of that Mad Max we saw back in 1996 <laughs> at Daytona later today. Always giving 110%. 110%. He also uh, has a line of steering wheels, Max Pappas MPI steering wheels. I've got one in my Trans Am car, pretty, pretty slick wheel. So it was the problem for Spencer Bumpelli in turn one. Let's take a look. Just at the end of it, it's the number 90, the prototype. Oh, you see the door. From Spirit of Daytona. The door took a beating. It's Valiente, it's Michael Valiente the in the 90. Understand the door is completely off the car. The only reason why it's staying on is because I'm holding it. Copy. <laughs> Yeah, we copy that. We got another door ready. There's no way to drive a race car. So it looked like it was closed, guys, but it was he was now having to hold it. So it was Michael Valiente that got into the side of the 45 or the 45 into the side of the 90, you name it. They, they got together at the apex of turn one. It's been busy for Jordan Taylor out there as well. We talked about the 52 cars that started. The 07 is out because of overheating but this is Jordan Taylor just before the caution came out trying to work his way through traffic we were on board for this the squeeze you just got to believe yes you can't you can't oh. if you pause it's too it's too late and the door closes for sure commitment you got to make it and these guys have it Got some prototypes pitting. It looks like the number 10 has come to pit road. I can't tell if that's the five or the nine that comes with him. Wayne Taylor racing is in, the five is in. Delta wing in as well, Andrew. Yeah, it certainly is. This one's a repeat pit stop to me. The little front wheels. I said they came off a French 2CV. In fact, they race those cars in a 24-hour racing. Even uh, Delta wing goes off. Very good stop from them. And now to you, Chris, what have you got? Well, Brian, that was the five car that came in with the 10 car. Also the 01, Scott Pruitt behind the wheel. And this team dealing with a car that's been pretty loose through this race. They were working on air pressure early on, now making a wing adjustment at the back of the car. They were running in uh, fifth place for the first couple hours of the race. They've uh, moved up to fourth, but also making a nose change here, trying to take a look and see if there's some damage. But the uh, dive planes on both sides look good. So I'm going to check in with the team and try and figure out why they're making a nose change here at this point in the race. 
think what they may be doing, the louver setup on this nose that's going on is different than the louver setup on the nose that came off. And You're right, it, Brian. It You're looks, right. Yeah, while it looks like it's just for, to exhaust air, but as that air comes out, it changes the downforce levels. Yeah, and, this, and the nose that they're putting on the car right now is less downforce on the front. So they're attacking a little bit at both ends, a little bit more rear wing, a little bit uh, less on the front. And of course, that is the right stop to do that because under the yellow, they can afford to stay that extra 10, 15 seconds. And that has, when the drivers give that level of feedback back, they would have been working with the engineers up on the pit box saying, can you run faster? Yeah, we can run faster. Can you be more consistent? Can you get better tire wear? What do you need to do that? I need, a, a, you know, a little bit more grip on the rear, a little less on the front. So uh, that was a very good strategic call, I believe. And when Memo got out of the car, they were reporting the car loose. They made a tire pressure adjustment. That obviously wasn't enough. So now they're going to the, the bigger aero chain. I think, too, when you look at the louver setup on these cars, a lot of times we look for dive planes on the front. Very, very visible as far as how the aerodynamics are. A lot of times those louvers are hard to see, and it's hard to understand how exhausting a little bit more air out of there is going to change the downforce. But it's I don't want to call it free downforce, but it has a lot less drag when you try to generate a little downforce in the front by exhausting the air out through the louvers than it does to put those big dive planes out in the front. Those tend to create a lot more drag on board the 42. Understand a problem for the 31 is going to be a stop and hold for two and a half minutes for an improper pass around the safety car. Ouch. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's, that's critical uh, it's well -time, broadcasting Justin. there. It's an ouch. And that's one of those things where the teams have to keep up with what is going on. The 08 in the pit lane as well. You've got to listen on the radio. And Brian and Ju Bruno Junqueira just leaving pit lane. He's leaving prototype challenge right now. The team just doing fuel, leaving those Continental tires on the car. All the teams have a race control radio and they're expected to monitor it and they're expected to know when they are to be waved around the safety car and the like. So it really kind of falls back onto the I'm team. Guess, I'm guessing they made up a lap and then so uh, a portion of that penalty will be to take away take the lap it, they yeah. gain and then a penalty on top of that so that you remember not to yeah. do it again. Yeah, that's just even if it's correct, it's <laughs> aggravating when you're the car. And they obviously, you remember in race control, they have a lot of resources. They, are, they have the cameras to play back. They have the on-track on spotters who are watching uh, uh, the action. So, you know, and when someone does do an in, in, in proper pass around, there's enough people that saw it. So, uh, so well, right now, I mean, Jordan is sitting there. Um, on, on track, he's still, in, he's actually going to probably restart if Bruno's leading his class, when they go back, Tommy, he will have to clear the three PC cars, which is what we saw with the GT cars earlier. Um, and look at this, almost all of the GTLM and GTD cars are in, even though there was a yellow not that long ago. It'll be interested to see if they just top up with fuel or if they actually do tires. And there's the door. The door will be replaced during this stop and Spencer's probably quite glad to get out. Andrew? Yeah, Spencer's just up on the big wall. I wonder if I can just grab him. Spencer! You've been having all kinds of dramas out there with the door. Sorry, we can't hear it all. Um, if that was my fault, I'm sorry, but I felt like I got the impact to any problem and, and got hit from behind. Probably an optimistic look, but uh, i got to watch the replay. Uh, hopefully, the car feels okay. I think the car's no damage. Uh, all the wheels are straight, everything's fine, so... Hopefully we can keep going and get that lap back and get back in this. How did you get the door shut? I held it the entire time we were under yellow. I was switching arms. It took a lot of force in some of the right-handers, but fortunately it wasn't at speed. It was under caution. But big thanks to everyone at Flying Lizard, man. We've had an up and down season and uh, guys have not stopped working as hard as they can. We're going to get this Audi back to the front. Very good. Thank you very much, Spencer. But Polly, got strong arms, that boy. I like the, the extra hit there on the door just to make sure as the 45 heads back out. I really hope Andrew Merritt isn't still in the car. Well, he may uh, be. He, <laughs> pulls down pit lane. he gets so... One thing, when, when I do Le Mans with Andrew, if, if, I get, if I'm too embarrassed to get up close to a situation, oh, I send Problem him, yeah. on the three. 
That is the three car. This, oh. this is in that schmazzle at the end of pit lane. If the, if the light was red. Oh, and look at the damage to the 911 Porsche as well. Right rear and left front. Whoa. This is huge. Good stops out. The 911 is out in front. Corvette's just to the left. And then the Ferraris involved the Porsche into the Ferrari. Corvette into the back of the Porsche. I think the Porsche hit the Ferrari first. Yep. And then. Uh, and cold tires, guys. I mean, they, they're on fresh new rubber. So braking capacity down. That is, that we saw it once. We saw it twice. And the third time it bit. I mean, that was very costly. Significant, significant impact both from the cars and to the the championships, manufacturers' championships, drivers' championships here involved in this problem on pit lane. And Brian, it got nuts before everything you just saw there when uh, the Dodge Viper, the Corvette, the Porsche, all three lined up, six cars here in pit lane. And, and I mean, these teams were working so hard to get their cars out, and the Porsches actually started getting into each other in the pit boxes down here as they were exiting, and as everybody was charging down to pit out. Well, pit out was closed, and that's when they all came together down there. So right now, we're seeing one of the Corvettes working its way back down pit lane, and I can see a lot of damage up on that left front corner. Now one of the Porsches coming around the corner, too. Lots of damage at the right rear corner. Hey, Chris, could you see the light? Had it been on, or did it just come on at the last moment? You know, I, I don't know if it was on or off. I, I was standing up on pit wall over by Porsche just because things got so nuts down here, and, and I think those drivers just got down there, and the light was uh, the red light was on because I think there was traffic still coming by on the racetrack, and these drivers just charging out of here, everybody trying to beat each other, trying to get a little bit of track position, and uh, and they just charged down to that light, and everyone realized that that red light was on. They could not exit pit lane, and there was that's when the stack up occurred. And you could see lots of damage up on this left front corner. The team just trying to get the body work off this car, and uh, right behind them, the 911. Damage to the left front corner, also lots of damage to the right rear corner of that car. Both of the cars that were damaged, the, uh, beside the Ferrari, there was no driver change. In both of the, the Porsche and in the Corvette, there was a driver change. And remember I said it's nice to be under yellow because there's so many things to hook and attach. You basically just get the thing latched and then you launch. And then once you're out on track, you start doing, you're, you're connecting maybe the drink hose that you see up there. Clear yard, red light, red light, red light, red light, red light. See, he was going for his belt. Looked he looked in, his in the mirror, mirror and he was uh, going the, for his belt. Which is standard practice. Yep. No, it's crazy. He sees it, clearly. Yep. Well, he was stationary for two or three seconds before he got hit. So, oh, and he ran and his. On board. Looking in his mirror, looking down for his belt. Oh, Bang. Yeah. yeah. You called it, Tommy. Yep. Oi. Absolutely. And then back again outside. What a mess. A more highly televised version of what you can see in your local. I was going to say, it's exactly what happens on every, the street every or, week. It's why you don't text and drive. Yeah. Go down to Andrew. I mean, you're very much. So what, what happened there, Jorgen? I guess uh, pit out was red again. Um, when I went out um, the first time, I got hit by the Ferrari because he didn't brake, because pit out was red. And now it seemed to be uh, that Patrick had to stop and the Corvette just drilled him in pit lane. It's unfortunate, but uh, nothing we can do about it. Doesn't look too bad, though. It's just body damage, yeah? Yeah, it just seems like body damage, but uh, obviously it has an aerodynamic effect, so we have to see how the car is now. OK, thanks very much. Thanks. What's going to be interesting here, though, is the 62 of Kaffa has gone behind the wall into the garage. And to me, it just looked like a rear diffuser broken, but something else. Maybe yeah. we can send the terror. I thought maybe the right rear was wobbling because he slowed down all those other cars. Yeah. made it back to the yeah. pits already. So maybe right rear suspension damage. You see the video screen there. That is the rear view mirror that the drivers use. Corvette and some of the Audis in GT Daytona actually use a radar system. You heard Spencer Pompelli talk about it. It's a video camera but it actually has arrows on it, and the arrows will be yellow or red the closer the target gets, and you'll know whether it's closing on you or dropping away. There's the damage on the 911 that Jörg Bergmeister was talking about. The problem is if you look to the left side of the car, you can see aerodynamic strakes 
out the the back of the wheel and those help evacuate air. air. Yep. Now the way to do this, see, they they've got a lot of damage that they're doing. The way to do this is to do it in chunks. Now, see, oh wow, yeah, this is this is going to hurt because the green flag is now back out and the laps will begin to be lost. You were gonna say, I was do gonna it in say, chunks. Do it in chunks, go back out, come in under the next lap under yellow, don't lose a lap. Oh, wow. When it rains, it pours. And now Jordan Taylor in the black prototype, beginning to work through traffic to get back out in front. Once again, four different classes of cars competing here at the 17th running of Petit Le Mans. It will not always be the overall leader that takes the green flag first on a restart because the classes will make pit stops and cycle through. So it's the first class leader that's behind the safety car when we're, go, when we're ready to go back to green that will lead the field to green. And that's what we just saw. And Jordan Taylor making short work to get back up front now just has to clear ringer Van de Zanda in then eight. Understand there'll be a penalty for the number seven, the Starworks entry for too fast on pit road. Oh, let's go. Go, 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 go. More work on the 911. I don't think the work is done, but they're going to get them out, back out. They'll probably make a plan based on what they've seen now to have some parts ready for the next time. It'll be interesting, too, to see the 10 and the 5. Once again, they've made adjustments every time they've stopped. Maybe an air pressure adjustment in the tire, maybe a little aerodynamic tweak here or there. The 10s had kind of the measure of the five, but now with the championship settled and a couple of changes will be interesting to see if Action Express, that Corvette, the number five, the red and white Corvette just behind the black prototype can begin to close back down. Number three looks like it's about ready to go, Chris. Yeah, Brian, they're about ready to go, but they have lost a couple laps here in pit lane, so obviously a bad position for Antonio Garcia and this championship. And just looking at what happened there, this big stack up at the end of the pit lane, I think part of the issue is you've got all these GTLM teams that are running up front pitted way down at pit out. So when all these teams come in, they're all going to race out of their pit box as quick as possible, trying to gain a position or two on everybody. But as they race out, that light is there. So these guys get up to speed really quick, then realize the pit lane's closed and they've all got to stop again like that. So I think just because everybody's jammed down here pit lane, that was one of the big things that contributed to that stack up. And it looks like the full course caution out again, the 55 BMW with a problem. Off to driver's right, it is stopped. Is there damage to the rear of that car? Is it just the lip on the spoiler just and the, the angle lip. of the camera? I believe it's just the lip, but where you, it's on that uphill yeah, bit. Yeah, see if you get started on crank two. It's, he's probably, he's turned off all the systems Sounds right like, now. He'll uh, be recycling. Need to get started on crank it's, uh, two. It's terminal. Oh, no. Oh. Sounds like that. Okay, copy that. Did you say it's terminal? Go back to full course yellow now. I think they're going to drag you in the pits here. He's just at the exit of 10B, which is if he could have cleared that hill, he could have rolled into pit lane. Well, but if it's terminal, uh, so I think crank one, crank two, there's a crank trigger sensor, yep. which is, is kind of vulner vulnerable. So it sounds like they have two on the car and they can switch uh, with a switch. So this is a this is welcome news. Corvette would have liked this about a lap or two yep. ago, but it'll give him a chance to maybe feel it out, see how it is and maybe make some more work. I, I would expect to see the 911 in again to have them take a look and start trying to do some more work on the right rear. Be interesting to see when the three gets to a straightaway, is the steering wheel straight? Yep. Is the alignment okay? It's hard to tell right now. Looks like it is. Doesn't look like any undue vibration coming through it. So, uh... so while we're under full course caution, let's go back to the pit incidents that happened and all that contact in the GTLM category. So. On board, Yan Magnuson, he heads down pit lane. Pulls all out. clear, all clear. He gets the all clear. He just looks down for an instant. So this is on board the Ferrari. He, he knows it's red. He's doing something down there. He gets hit. Hit hard, and he's like, what? what was that? You see his hands go up. Oh, come on. Yep, I would agree. And then Patrick Pile. See his belts are fastened but not tight. Watch his eyes. Go, 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 go. Research your fuel. He Research looks up your fuel. and he's startled by what he sees, you can tell. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny, you have it in domestic driving now and watch you have it, it in racing. 
Watch it from outside. You know, Jörg Bergmeister says the Corvette just rear ends him, but I think Porsche hit him first. Uh, the Porsche, then... Porsche hit the Ferrari first, and then Magnussen looked up. But basically, both Pile and Magnussen, two of the best sports car drivers in the world, got caught out. And this red light is not is is. I mean, it's it's not new, but it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. I think Chris called it very well from down there. He's got a bird's eye view of it. They are stacked. The top teams, GTLM, are at the end of pit lane, and so within a two three hundred foot span. You have all these cars coming out at the same time. And because of the close nature of the racing this week, it, it, at Petite this year, we we have everyone coming in at the same time. And every, no, everyone, no one's out of rotation right now, which often after almost three hours you'd expect, but uh, very tight racing. I, I mean, Kaffer, he is the victim. unfortunate victim in all this. I mean, yeah. it really is. Uh, when we said the race could, could be won or lost in the pits, this is yeah. not generally what we're speaking about. No, but it is. You, I mean, uh, you, any time, at any time. Got to be nobody to blame but himself in this one. But wow, like I said, you, you get things buckled up and then under yellow, you know, you just want to get out there, but you're trying to get in the line as quick as you can. You're, the only thing you're thinking about is when you're going to release the pit speed uh, limiter when you get to that yeah. cone. And uh, obviously it was not expecting to stop, but this you know, is exactly why uh, moments in attention you know, on the, in the street, I mean, you know, it's, it's texting and so forth. Here it was uh, mirrors and belts. And there's the problem on the 62, suspension damage to the left rear. And, you know, Underwing. the problem with the GT class is it's based on a production vehicle. It's not a race car that, like a prototype, that comes apart easily and the, and the parts are very module and they, they go into place and come out of place. It's a, it takes a lot more work. The Corvettes are pretty module, modular piece, but this Ferrari, not so much. Andrew? Yeah, I'm with Fizzy here. We're looking at the damage, and uh, this is where race mechanics earn their living, isn't it? Yeah, very shame. Uh, we were in a good shape uh, in the top three always. Uh, the car was good. And uh, in a pit stop, uh, I think we came early. Uh, we came out uh, by first uh, before the the end of the pit lane, there was the red light. Obviously, Pierre uh, is stopped uh, in a right position, but uh, he'd been hitting by, uh, I think Magnussen went to the to the back of the, the Porsche and the Porsche went to the back of our car. There are lots of damage, unfortunately. We are losing lots of laps. I don't know if uh, they are doing the best, but uh, I think now the race is over. Uh, bad luck then, they're rebuilding the rear suspension here and some body work as well, but uh, I'm going to toss it back to Chris Neville. Well, Andrew, also some bad luck down at BMW, the 55 up in the air. Billy, what's going on with the car? Uh, I don't know, but it just was crazy. At the start of the race, I went over the curve and turned four, and the motor shut off, and then it turned back on. And now we think we're in the catbird seat when everybody wrecks into each other in pit lane, and it shuts off again. And this team is stunned never had a mechanical issue with that BMW Z4 in two years. So it might be wiring or electrical and they're gonna dig into it as much as they can, but nobody knows where to go. But that's why you have two bullets in the chamber. We got a white one, it's strong, everything's looking good and um, great lineup of drivers and we just have to root those guys on to win the race now. You, haven't, you say you haven't seen electrical issues previously. How tough is that for the mechanics now when they've never seen something like this before? I I, it's got to, well, they don't know where to start. That's the thing. So I'm sure you see all these wires are plugged in now. They're going to look through all the data and try to isolate what the problem is, the ECU, the wiring harness, something, and, um, and just start replacing parts, see if we can get back out there. Well, initially, the crew was all over this car right now. As Billy said, this car is just plugged into a lot of data. Crew members just trying to sit around and see what the engineers can figure out. Not the day Bill Oberlin wanted to have, that's for sure. But back in 1999, he had a pretty bad day here as well. Actually, I guess you could look at it the other way. He had a pretty good day considering what happened on the racetrack. And if you're a fan of sports car racing and you remember back to the prototype days, take a look at this. It was so extreme when he came in front of me that it sucked my head forward and it sucked my visor open before I took off. Nothing hit really hard. It was soft and smooth, but I, I got one scratch on my arm, but I didn't know if I cut my arm off. But no, it's fine. No worries. Look how quick he's hopping out of the <laughs> car. Uh-oh, now they're pushing it back behind the wall. 
He's another guy that if you look in the dictionary, what a racing driver means, Bill Oberlin's pictures there. Isn't that right, Andrew? Yeah, well, that was me doing the interview with him afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, I can't believe how cool he was. It had a huge accident. We, we actually showed it him on the screen after that, and he did a commentary on it. But it was uh, all, all the American racing I've done. I mean, that is the luckiest escape I've ever seen. It was, and you know, I can remember back in the day, several blowovers on the back straightaway. He was just stoked because he knew that video was going viral. <laughs> if there was viral in 1990. Different viral back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't think Bill Arverland has changed at all yeah, since then. Uh, the inflection, the driving. I, I remember asking him what that was like, and he, and basically, it's like a uh, pulling the stick back on a fighter plane. When the thing takes off, it just forced his head down, and he couldn't, you know pulling a bunch of G's straight down so he didn't get to see any of the ride. But if you notice, <laughs> he was hopping out before, virtually as the car stopped, he was getting out. He didn't want to stay in it for long. Yeah. That's something that happens when you have a big crash and it takes a while for the car to grind to a halt. You've been going 150, 100, 780. When you're going 20, you feel like you're stopped. And so you, you know, you it's jump the, out. It's the motorcycle out. rider yeah. who's sliding along and then decides, okay, I'm slow enough to stand up. Yeah, not so much. Mistake. Yannick Dalmas had, uh, a pretty similar incident, a pretty scary incident as well. If that was the Olympics, you would say the uh, the uh, French judge gave 10 points for takeoff and eight points for landing. I was going to say, Arbelin <laughs> stuck the landing better than yeah, Dalton. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think back to that time, remember uh, the Mercedes at, at, Le, Mans? at yeah. Le Mans? Which time? Yeah, which time? Our second, third, yeah. third. Same it, driver twice. During, during that era, it was not at all uncommon. And that's why when you look at the prototypes now and you see those openings, it's not just for that. And, and in fact, it was really designed for sideways, a uh, side slide at a high rate of speed. But they've worked really hard, even with the under trays, to keep these cars on the ground. Well, we saw the Viper do a pretty big wheelie at, at VAR in the, in the climbing S's, uh, Bomarito. It uh, didn't, didn't blow over, but he, he rode the wheelie for a good while. So uh, just what you think, air, air is funny. Obviously, you can't see it, but uh, you, know, you never know quite how close. When you, if you have a too big a lever behind the rear wheels, pushing on that, the, how big the under tray is in the front, following distance, et cetera. So it, it, you get these perfect storms and uh, stuff like that happens. Just past 2 o'clock East Coast time, 2 hours and 47 minutes and change down and that means out of a 10 hour race well we still have seven hours and call it 13 minutes yet to go jordan taylor leads in prototype bruno jincara and prototype challenge patrick long in gt Le Mans, and in gt daytona it's cooper mcneil brian till tommy kendall and justin bell with you chris neville matt yokum and andrew marriott down in pit lane a beautiful day to be in pit lane nice and cool bright sunshine the guys couldn't ask for any better weather than what we have this year. We've seen a, a shift in the last 30 seconds in the uh, energy coming from the drivers on these inboards. They were they were chilled out and relaxed a minute ago, taking the most of that little break they had. But now you can start to see them, as I say that, he's not, but he's starting to warm the front tires up, starting to get some energy back into everything and heat, because I do believe it won't be long before we, we get the green flag. And what that does, is it allows you to hit your operating temperatures and your maximum speed within the shortest distance of time at the start. I'm not a massive fan of warming the tires like that. Sometimes you see, I mean, you do it, but some people do it a lot and some people do it a little. I mean, Alonso in Formula One is the king of it. I've never, I'm terrified every time he does it. That chap there is worried about things. Um, he's awake. You think he's asleep. He was just looking down. Uh, I know. The, f <laughs> the fans here, though, you got to hand it. Oh. We see the fans, Sebring, Daytona, Le Mans, and here we have, I, was, I saw this shot earlier and I was about to say, these guys love this race. They come out, if you think sports car racing doesn't have a strong fan base, these guys, and I know any of you that are watching, if you're within 500 miles, you'd be here. These guys got very wet last night. And this, this red clay, they doesn't have, come out of your clothes. Most of them <laughs> intense. They absolutely love this place. A look at the top 10 in the prototype category. Petit Le Mans for 17 years, it's not a race. It's an event, and I think that's why the fans turn out like they do. Bruno Giancara leading in the prototype challenge category for Paul Ginalozzi's RSR Racing. John Bennett being shown in third. Patrick Long in the 912 Porsche. 
being shown in the lead of GTLM, but that's been hard fought both on the racetrack and in pit lane, as we just saw a little bit earlier. And Madison Snow and Jan Halen in the 58. They lead in GT Daytona, but Cooper McNeil being shown in second. That could play into the championship. The 27, the GT Daytona entry from Dempsey Racing now on pit lane. Andrew? Yeah, and Patrick Dempsey has just climbed into the car. Just look on these legs. Well, oh, wait for that beautiful flat six engine to blast away. Down the side of his leg, it's got Dream Black. I believe they call him Dr. McDreamy or something, don't they? Come on, Andrew, you don't watch the show a lot? You're not, you're not a Grey's Anatomy fan? No, it's not really a big deal in the UK. I and mean, we noticed it a lot last year, or this year as well. It's a huge deal in France. But, you know, it's on Channel 382, I think, in England. And strange enough, it isn't a big deal. Uh, maybe not in your demographic. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out he's there. A, he's a lovely, he's a great actor, and he's done a lot for the sport. I think it's great to have him here, yeah, you know. Flag. Look at the start the Delta Wing got. Gabby Chavez coming down the hill. There was a little brake checking going on. Chavez, the second car in your shot, left from his position back in fourth or fifth up to being shown in position number two past Christian Fittibaldi in the number five. Jordan Taylor with a good jump. He's going to have some lap traffic, some GT Daytona traffic in front. It's going to get busy in the S's. And Chavez, a, a young charger from Columbia, this year's Indy Lights champion and uh, trying to make the move up into IndyCar. But uh, look at him. He uh, not shy about defending wow. his position. Second place on the track in the Delta Wing. I almost feel like Christian doesn't need know how to deal with it when yeah. he's there because you don't know how much pressure you can put on him, especially coming down through those S's. So and with that by the back marking traffic, it, it allowed him certainly to settle in. Chavez was able to settle in in the Delta Wing, but all to the benefit of Jordan Taylor right now. It's a little bit like when you're when you're behind a motorcycle, you know, you, you feel weird, weird about getting too close to it. The, the thing is so small compared to everything else around it. Well, it's one of the complaints that some of the drivers had had in years past was that you just couldn't see it very well. I know they changed the light configuration on it so it was a little more visible in the dark. And right Here now, Christian Fittipaldi being aggressive down into two and a half one. wide again. And for Gabby, Gabby Chavez, he could care less that the name is Fittipaldi. He wants to fight hard into turn one, does. But Christian Fittipaldi slips by. He's anything like the other Colombians, Montoya <laughs> and Yakuman. Not going to give you an inch. This was the car I was about to say before that yellow. You were saying cars to watch. Well, of course, we've just made some pretty significant aero changes to Pruitt's car. So it'll be interesting to see how he develops. They put a new front end on it, so it had less front downforce and increased the rear wing. So they did that for a reason because they were not getting that rear grip. So let's uh, let's see what their lap times are from now. But you know what's interesting? Scott Pruitt has always liked a loose race car, certainly much more so than Memo Rojas. So it'll be interesting to see, while this may suit Rojas's driving style a little bit better, Scott Pruitt may not like it. And we understand that a full course caution out yet again, caution number six. And you just don't, yeah, it's just way too many. We had 10 full course cautions in 2011 for 62 laps. We're already on eight. I think we should just call it lack of caution, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it, everyone gets going. It's very oh, exciting. A, a lot hit. of front yeah, end damage hit. there. And, and but, here's the deal, I, you know, Dorsey likes to, to say that cautions bring breed cautions, and they do with 50 plus cars on the racetracks, but you gotta be smarter than this. I mean, you're going back to racing. You've got seven hours to go. I have no idea who's at fault for this incident, but somehow, Road some way. One, I lost steering. Copy that, copy that. I lost steering, I'll he said. I'll talk to you when you get back here. So maybe a mechanical issue, but we've certainly yeah, before or after he hit the wall well, on that yeah. one, I'm not sure, Brian. But you know what? It, it, it's always easy for us to jump to a conclusion. However, you're right. Cold tires, cooler tires coming off the back. You're in traffic. You're in different multi-class racing. Very easy for for mishaps to happen. Unfortunately, it brings out another yellow. And those strategists right now, Tommy, are saying, all right, let's hit the reset again on the on the program. Well, and you have, because so little time has happened, they have these quick cautions where they don't uh, do the wave arounds. They don't, because there's been no lapping taking place. So, and sometimes it, they don't even open the pit lane. 
Uh, but since we've had two in a row, uh, I'm not sure how that works, if, if uh, they'll give guys a chance, strategy-wise, to come in and top up. Certainly no need for fuel. Uh, uh, you say top up, but, I mean, two laps. Well, I mean, but you had, they had one before that, so, yeah. so you know, 15 minutes is where the cutoff is. Usually, if it's within 15 minutes, they do the expedited caution procedure. Well, and you think about it, I mean, it's... It, it, it's too early to back time. It's Tom Papadopoulos who was in the 88. But you're, you're always looking and you're always saying, you know, from the back of the race, it, how far back can I go? It's not too early to back time to the first uh, awarding of points ah, on the four hours for the for Patron, Patron Cup. Cup. Yes. So we're an hour and five minutes from that. So you'll have some teams starting to, to look at that. But if you're a prototype team, you know you've got one more anyway. So it's it's about track position going into that last one. You can't do it if you change now, if you put fuel in there. So it's not just one chess game here this week, and we've talked about all the championships on the line. The Patron Cup is there as well, and you got to play that chess game to be the leader at that four-hour, eight-hour, and ten-hour mark. Andrew? Yeah, well, I'm with Catherine Legg, who had a great first run in the uh, Delta Wing there, Catherine. Yeah, it was good. Um, we've had a competitive car all weekend. And uh, so far, yeah, so far so good. I don't want to jinx us or anything, so I'm just going to keep fingers crossed. Okay, and the, this is um, this car seems to be running very well on fuel. We seem to have a bit more fuel mileage. Yeah, you know, the concept of the Delta Wing has always been efficiency, and um, we're lighter, we use less tyres, and we use less fuel, so that's the advantage. Unfortunately, it's gone against us so far in the race because we've done probably four more laps than the others on a tank of fuel. But then the yellow's come out, we've had to pit then, and so we, we've lost the advantage. Um, but hopefully later on in the race, when it counts, it's going to go for us. It's still a long, long way to go. Thank you very much, Catherine. And over to Chris Neville. Well, Andrew, Doug Feehan oversees the Corvette racing program. And Doug, a lot of work on that three car. What's the state of it and what was broken there? Well, we put a new nose box on it, left front fender and lighting system. It uh, should be just fine right now. Uh, the damage obviously was extensive, but these guys are pretty well equipped to deal with those sort of things. We've done that many, many times before. You know, we took a look at a lot of different replays. I know you have a chance to see all that stuff where you sit on the box here. What did you see? Well, the 911 car left the pit lane without his seat belts fastened, and he was uh, focused on looking down, uh, fastening his seat belts, didn't see the Ferrari stopped. You know, in avoidance of the Ferrari, he changed lanes, moved right, right into our path, and uh, we ran into the back of him. Now, I know you guys pick apart everything that goes on in these races. What do you take back from this, take back to Detroit and talk to these guys about so this doesn't happen in the future? Well, really, I think it's going to be uh, looking at some of these rules and closing the pit lane with that red, which came out rather quickly. We almost had a pile up the first time, obviously the second time we did. But I think uh, pit marshals ensuring the fact that guys have their seat belts fully fastened and are ready to exit pit lane for a safe release, I think, is really paramount. That was responsible for this wreck we saw down here. Obviously pretty disappointed, everything going on with the three. Well, he's got reason to be disappointed. Their championship, their driver's championship could have gone away. It certainly changed the complexion of the event. But for Jordan Taylor, smooth sailing so far. He leads from the 17th running of Petit Le Mans. Back at Road Atlanta, we'll pick up the action later in the race, but you won't miss a thing. Early in the going, lead change in the overall as Ricky Taylor takes over from Joao Barbosa. You can see it there, traffic was involved. Joao Barbosa was balked a little bit, going through turn 12. Ricky Taylor swept through to take the lead in the break zone for turn one. Then just moments later, Joao Barbosa had completed his minimum 45 minute drive time. Championship points were his, he does a driver change. Afterward, Matt Yoakum spoke with new champion Joao Barbosa. When the season began, team manager for Action Express, Gary Nelson's motto was simply expect to win, and, and they've done that on the racetrack. Three wins, and Joel Barbosa, the biggest win of all, the championship. What means the championship to you most as far as that level of accomplishment? I mean, it means a lot. To be the first champion of the Twitter United Sports Car Series, it's just unbelievable. This is a new era of sports car. It's been great. I'm very proud to be a part of it. I couldn't have done without Action Express. Also, congratulations to Action Express for their team win. And uh, just an amazing group of guys. Christian's in the car, hopefully. He's going to be able to do his 45 minutes and get uh, his championship as well. But uh, everything has been uh, a dream year. Now we can go actually racing. We still have the Patron Cup to, to go after. So everything is looking good from now on. And you mentioned that once Christian completes his stint and he scores his championship, now you can flip the switch and, and then it's definitely game on for the win. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was super conservative initially with traffic. It's very, very tough out there. 
and um, we want to get the points out of the way, we want to get the championship. Uh, we're really proud with the support of Chevy, uh, ECR engines and uh, Continental tires. Everybody has done a tremendous job this year. We just have to finish it up. We have one more championship to go after, the Patron Cup, so we're looking forward to go and we actually can go racing now. All right, congratulations. Thank you, appreciate it. Here in Prototype Challenge, we have a little bit of a spin happening. And of course, is the 87 of Mark Drumright. A simple spin, no damage done. And in GT Le Mans, there was a battle that was raging fiercely. We're looking ahead as you see championship contender Antonio Garcia and that number three yellow Corvette go side by side with the factory Porsche, the number 912 of Earl Bamba. Great battles in the GTLN class, said to be the best GT racing in the world, and these guys are showing why. Wolf Hensler in the blue number 17, York Bergmeister in the factory white Porsche 911, all battling on behalf of the same manufacturer. And three almost wide. three wide there. Oh wow, yeah. That got tight. That's Antonio Garcia. Remember, he's in the championship hunt. Don't expect to see him taking chances like that in the Corvette. And then an embarrassing pit incident. Well, what happens is when we're under caution here and the field comes around on the front straightaway, pit lane is closed. The Ferrari of Pierre Caffer sees the red light. Right behind him, Patrick Pillay in the factory Porsche runs into the back of him. Here we're on board with him. Look down at his seatbelts. He doesn't see the Ferrari stopped. He rams him. And then Jan Magnussen right behind him. You can see the subsequent damage to the yellow Corvette. And damage to the back end of the 911 Porsche. You saw that as well. You wonder how can they do that? Well, they're all looking to get their belts tight. Problems for Spencer Papelli and his GTD Flying Lizard Audi. The driver door wouldn't stay closed. He did lap after lap, holding the door closed with either arm. He later pitted and fixed it. And there's the Ferrari 555 Townsend Bell leading the GT Daytona class. Fourth and points coming into the race. And with that, we're back to live pictures. As the Mazda safety car leads the field around, about to go green after our sixth full course caution in the opening three hours of this race. It's been the story of the race. Nothing but these cautions after cautions. The second of the Taylor brothers. Now Jordan green, Taylor green, leads this green, field green, back green. to the flag stand, followed by Christian Fittipaldi and then Gabby Chavez, who has been sensational in that delta wing here in the last hour of this race. Gabby wants to get that delta wing in the front. He wants it to lead laps, and he's doing everything he can. Gabby Chavez, the newly crowned Indy Lights champion. Moving over to sports cars and doing a great job, as you boys pointed out. Michael Valiente, Scott Pruitt, and John Pru all follow. Then the first of the PC cars in the hands of Bruno Junquera. Well, that Delta Wing project is based here right in Brazil to Georgia. They've been doing a lot of testing here over the last couple of months, and certainly their progress is showing here. The car was quick yesterday in practice. They felt they really didn't get all of the potential out of the car in qualifying. But boy, oh boy, it's been really strong here in the early going. And for viewers who have never seen this car before, it's a real novel concept. They took a car and they built it very narrow in the front so there's not a lot of aerodynamic drag. It's extremely lightweight, runs a little four-cylinder turbo engine, makes good power, but the real trick is to keep it at a minimum weight. It's really fast. And it's worth noting that Catherine Legg, one of two female drivers in this race who started the car, did a terrific job keeping it competitive. There you see it on track as we go to the pit lane and Chris Neville. Well, Bob, three-time IndyCar champion Scott Dixon helping out on the 01 this weekend. And Scott, it seems like the car hasn't had the speed of the Corvettes, but you guys have been taking some pretty big swings at it, making some aerodynamic changes. Are you getting closer? No, I think so. You know, it's uh, it's so much fun to be in another Cheetah Championship race. And, and uh, you know, the Telmix car has been running fairly decent. It's just been very easy for us to miss the balance. It's, it's kind of a, a small box that we're trying to deal with. but. Uh, Definitely some wholesale changes going on here with uh, area like downforce and changing that in the middle of the race. You know, we've just, uh, lost some spots, but uh, I'm excited to get in the car and hopefully we can get a lot of these yellows out of the way. Well, this team has seen victory lane so many times at the Rolex 24. They're looking for their first win here at Petit Le Mans. Andrew? Well, I'm with Patrick Dempsey, who's just climbed out of the very smoky Porsche. Patrick, not a nice moment, actually. No, it's unfortunate we don't get a chance to finish the race now. I uh, just got behind the wheel, so I didn't have much of it. But I want to thank Red Scarlet and Rewards, JP Morgan, for coming on board for this race. I wish we had a better run for them. Beauty rest, of course, Porsche. And, uh, you know, it's just a frustrating season. Uh, we had one good run in there. Um, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. 
got hit, the car got hit earlier on. Do you think that might have caused a problem? It could have. Who knows what happened at this point? I think it overheated, and then that just was a, a chain of events, and it's unfortunate. It's a lot of traffic out here, and you just can't make any mistakes, and it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Your passion for racing is still burning. You've got another season coming. Have you got plans? Oh, yeah, we'll make an announcement at the LA Car Show. I'm really excited about next year. We're going to keep racing, absolutely. I mean, I love this sport. I mean, this is part of it. You're going to have good days and bad days, and you just can't, you just got to keep fighting and not give up on this. It's too bad. We were going to stay out as long as we can. Uh, well, the 58 car is doing really well, so we'll root them on, and we'll see what happens. You can tell me. Are you moving up a class? We'll make an announcement. <laughs> At the LA Car Show, it's very, really exciting, and we'll, we'll do some other stuff. So we're expanding and contracting, which is good. Thank you, Superstar. Back to the boot. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. There you see the leader in the GT Le Mans class right now, the only American Porsche factory driver, Patrick Long. Yeah, he's certainly running a strong stint right here, but you can see Ollie Gavin in the number four, the yellow Corvette. These guys are split right now by a PC car, prototype challenge car, but it's going to be a fascinating battle here today. We've got driver's championships on the line, and the manufacturer's title is extremely tight. Right now, Porsche are tied for the lead with Viper, but Corvette and BMW still have a shot at the title as well. And it is, of course, one of the nuances of running four classes at once that you get interrupted by other people playing through, if you want to call it that way. Traffic management is one of those two to keys to victory. You've got to really manage that. When you get up the hill here down into turn one and start to climb that hill, for the next half lap, you just have to be patient there. It's almost impossible to get a move done cleanly. Top seven cars in the GT Le Mans class all running on the same lap. Patrick Long in a Porsche, Oliver Gavin in a Corvette, Dominic Farnbacher in a Viper. Plunge down the hill through the S's another time, working lap number 119. We'll be back with more of the 17th annual Petit Le Mans here on Fox.